Hello. <laughs> My name is Zach, otherwise known as Great Samino. Welcome to The Hole in the World, an actual play of uh, the Invisible Sun RPG uh, created by Monty Cook Games. Uh, I'm really excited to be joined by everybody on our 13th episode uh, this weekend. Uh, and you'll s I'm also incredibly glad to be joined by uh, my lovely cast, starting with To My Right, uh, playing Gavrielle. Hey, uh, it's Marcy, aka Experimental Madness, and I play Gavrielle Glinsky, the iconoclastic ardent apostate that hosts a choir. <laughs> Uh, and to her right, uh, playing uh, our other apostate, Twig. It's me, Hopper. Um, I am playing Twig, the uh, mendicant, gallant apostate who eats knowledge. Nom, nom, nom. <laughs> and uh, below Twig, playing our resident Vance, uh, Kiri. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Marissa, also known as Critical Kitten, and I play Curiel von Hollingsworth, first assistant librarian to the Order of the Vance. She is an aromatic stoic who understands the words and recently has just acquired the title of curator to the formidable and inimitable collection of King Nine and his library. Oh, and that's, that's going to be pretty exciting to see uh, what the ramifications of that are. Uh, I'm excited. And finally, uh, playing our resident uh, weaver, Maurice. What up? Uh, my name is Bill, <laughs> at Ghostbike on Discord. I'm playing Maurice Webb, a stalwart empath of the Order of Weavers who turns tales into the reality and is basically just a caretaker for a Shetland sheepdog with black and white fur named Duncan. Yeah, we know a lot very much. We, we know who the uh, star of the show is. We all know. <laughs> Uh, so we're getting a little bit of uh, chat stuff. Uh, hello to everybody in chat joining us. Um, Hi, everybody. Super excited. Hello. Yeah, Jai Z, congratulations on the new cube. Um, <laughs> so I am going to uh, let you guys know um, basically uh, what happened last session. Uh, so as you guys may or may not have seen, um, we uh, are actually currently situated, our Vizle, as they are uh, known, are situated in the secret library of um, King Nine, who is a mob boss that is unique and uh, kind of powerful and very well known within the world of Saturine, uh, the city of notions. And you guys have found yourself in this candle flame keep that seems to occupy its own liminal space. And after some wheeling and dealing for the sake of a fictional character brought to life named Basil Fictorum, uh, you guys have managed to um, find yourselves in this library that is part forest, part treasure trove of secret knowledge and information. So um, thousands and thousands of books, all kind of housed and stored in these shelf, the like these tree-like shelves. Um, majestic natural beauty as far as you can see um, around you and kind of directly behind you a door back to the rest of the manor. Some things also happened, uh, namely you guys were able to um, hide yourselves from detection uh, by invoking a favor um, that King Nine owed Basil Fictorum, basically a demon gifted you with his own ability of non-detection. And uh, not only that, but you guys found out that Basil knows a lot more about you than has been letting on, and he has offered you a trade, namely that you pull the people and the um, other supporting characters that are basically his family that were killed in the bad ending of his own book. In exchange, he will give you a item known as the War Report, a living document that tells you more about your own personal histories. And he made sure to kind of point this to all of you, saying this is relevant to all of your personal histories. And so we're kind of opening on that moment. And uh, before we get started, uh, I'm going to put on a little bit of music. And anybody who is in the um, chat, let me know if this is um, audible. And. Well, I can hear it. <laughs> yeah, there we go. 
And then finally- I can hear it, that's why I'm stripping. <laughs> oh god. <laughs> this is not that kind of music, Hopper. <laughs> and finally- Don't kink shame me. <laughs> and then uh, finally, uh, we're also going to turn a card uh, on the Path of Suns because it is essentially a new day. And our first card is Compelling Voice. Its color is invisible. It is a belonging to the Secrets, Ravens, Books, and Flame family. Its meanings are control, domination, and persuasion. <laughs> the right voice can command an army. In word or song, the compelling voice bids us to do something we might not do otherwise. It moves us, frightens us, appeals to our sense of reason. Those who master such a technique have a weapon in their arsenal equal to any other. Because the Seekers family is related to books, however, it's worth considering that the voice in question might actually come in the form of a written message. The speaker might be an author instead. Mostly, however, compelling voice is considered to be the outsider of the Secrets family. And, you know, there's this beautiful image of this woman backlit by the moon kind of gesturing while reading a, a book aloud, uh, her eyes aglow with some sort of eerie moonlight. So... I think what this is, this is actually kind of a really nice kind of segue deep into the first where we left off. You guys have been, you know, seemingly either compelled or persuaded to, um, and basically, you know, you have been kind of persuaded to do this thing by Basil Fictorum. And what I want to know is, you know, I left you guys last episode in, in the middle of a pile of sets of books and uh, you guys were kind of pouring over researching until um, your eyes were bloodshot. What have you guys, what does that look like for you? Well, Secrets, Ravens, and Books are in fact moi. Um, can I make some bullshit up, Zach? You may absolutely make some bullshit up. I'm very excited. So, Twig is wandering around, kind of really intrigued by these tree bookshelves. Like, that's kind of exactly my jam. That is my, that's my aesthetic. Um, <laughs> and uh, just kind of goes, just wants to see how deep this goes. Um, and eventually I find, like, this cool little nook with this massive, like, heavily carved, maybe mahogany or teak or some other kind of dark exotic wood. Um and there's a tiny little golem made out of paper that just starts beckoning to Twig. And um, and I'm just like, man, what's the worst that could happen? It's only a demon dude's library. <laughs> and um, <laughs> follows that, because of course I do. And um, yeah, and I find like what appears to be a nice little alcove that's you literally have to crawl underneath this table and kind of back behind another bookshelf. Um, whether this is intentional or this just kind of happened by accident is unclear. And I will be poking around the books I find there. Excellent. Okay. Uh, what are the uh, rest of you guys doing? I think, Gabrielle, how long do you think we've been here since we kind of cut away last session? An uh, hour, just a few minutes? This, you guys... Today? <laughs> you guys tell me. What, uh, what do you think is reasonable? I think you guys are kind of... You know, you can either have just be surveying all this and you're finding something, or you could have been at this for hours. You you tell me. Okay. I, I'm I'm feeling I'm feeling hours. Yeah. yeah I mean, the, the the stuff about being like having bloodshot eyes and all that makes me think we've been here for at least a couple of hours. Well, and Kiri, remember, has a persistent reason to be here, and so I think she would want to stay here as long as we possibly could. Absolutely. Yeah. So with that in mind, then I think Gav is uh, on a high simmer, close to boiling point because she's not a researcher. Uh, these books mean nothing to her. Uh, all she knows is that they finally got something off their back and they're still fucking around. And she's uh, tr was trying to be patient for the first hour. <laughs> and then uh, the second hour passed and she started pacing. The third hour passed, and uh, she's already cleaned her gun twice. <laughs> and uh, the fourth hour passed, 
and she is actively kicking some of the books over that like were like maybe laid up in some piles uh stomping around probably trying to get y'all's attention to be like we need to go we should get going we're not going to find anything or anyone staying in this library i think at that moment maurice uh, is uncharacteristically not not even reacting. He found some fiction, and while he was originally reading it, um, he is sitting at the uh, table where the Spiders game was last played. He's sitting in where King Nine was sitting, looking at the board from his point of view, and the book is kind of splayed open on the table, and Maurice has the his testament kind of on the table, and is kind of like you know, kind of just vaguely touching it, fingering it, you know, feeling the grooves of it. So, and just kind of staring out into space at the board. So before we proceed, what does uh, your Testament of Sons look like? For people that um, are just kind of new to this game, a Testament of Sons is literally uh, kind of like almost like a small tchotchke or, uh, or icon of a hand that re is a, a six-fingered hand that is representative of a person's personal development and of their soul, um, at least within the context of this game. So what does that look like for you? It looks like it was made in a sixth grade art class, fired like, uh, you know, with like toothpicks into the clay and, you know, fired in the kiln, like something a sixth grader would be proud of, mm -hmm. um, but not necessarily a work of art. Uh, it's, you know, the, 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 the finish is uneven, so the shine isn't quite right. But the the grooves of the the final product are, are kind of very satisfying, very tactile. Absolutely. I I will actually add a little bit of an addendum to that, which is the last time you looked at it, it had this kind of, you know, like you said, this kind of workman like this, you know, child's representation almost. But you notice something, which is that there is seems to be an intricate pattern. Um, almost kind of like of small bits of handwriting uh, that run up the line of your thumb, of the uh, testament's thumb, around the edge of the palm here. It's very different. It seems smoother. Duncan notices. Uh, he, he's Duncan and I are both getting antsy. <laughs> he, he, he's currently sitting in my lap. Uh, and I'm kind of, you know, with the one, one hand on the testament, kind of petting and very absentmindedly. I think I noticed this new aspect of my testament kind of out of the corner of my eye, and it's not really registering. And that's when you hear Gabrielle kind of exclaim, what do you, what do you kind of like, what's going through your head? Uh, I, I, I look up and I agree with her. I don't think we should spend more time in this place, but Maurice is feeling like uh, like a little bit in the, like the get out sunken place. Like he's viewing everything from pretty far away. Yeah. And and is, so head head is up, but no response. And I think right about that same time, um, actually before this, Kiri, what are you up to? Well, so Kiri's a librarian. Uh, this is her world, what she knows, what she lives and breathes, uh, what she's devoted her whole life to. She's at home here. And, you know, thinking about the compelling voice card that we pulled, you know, that's very, just almost bookily accurate for Kiri's bold ask at the end of last session. Um, in putting herself forward to be the curator of King Nine's collection. Um, she's feeling very invigorated by that decision, um, almost flush with power for what she's done for her campus, um, potentially for research, access to a breadth, a wealth of materials that it wouldn't have been possible, you know, for the Vans to get in, in any other way. Um, but at the same time, she's almost intimidated by the size of the task before her and sort of the ironclad promise she's made, which she's reminded by with a 
bracelet on her wrist. It's a promise she can't break. Um, and so she's really set about, you know, committing herself to the beginning of that task and starting to actually catalog the materials in King Nine's collection so she can begin to just conceptualize a taxonomy that could bring all of it together. Yeah, overwhelming does not begin to describe the task. You see books flying overhead from shelf to shelf, apparently nesting. Uh, and it, uh, it's almost like watching pigeons migrating uh, and flying in and out. Um, and that is probably, I believe, when you hear Gabrielle kind of exclaim agitatedly to the rest of the group. Kiri sort of looks back towards Gabrielle when she exclaims this, but her mind is spinning a mile a minute. You know, she's already looked at these books that are flying above her and gone, how could we engineer a solution to capture them? Uh, to know which ones have flight patterns at certain times of day, to know where they roost, to try to guide them um, in terms of almost like tra air traffic control, but for books. Um, <laughs> she's just started to dream up systems where the knowledge can continue to be free and move about freely, but as a librarian, she will know where it is at all times and it can map to a wider system of this library. Um, at the same time, you know, she now feels a pull back hearing Gav say this. Um, so most likely, you know, she looks up from a book that she's been looking at um, and flipping through, a book that actually the words are trickling off the page as she reads them. Um, and swirling with words on the other page so that it's reordering itself as you read. Um, and again, she's thinking, how could I capture the order of this book because it's constantly changing? Um, but, you know, seeing Gav exclaim, I think she closes the book and walks over to where Gav is. You want to leave? I absolutely do. What are we doing wasting our time? We have we have what we came for. Do we? I don't think Yeah. We have the ability to to walk without our enemies noticing us. We have the advantage now of complete surprise. We know who we need to find. And now we also have an item that we need to get. And she's gesturing over um to Basil. It's like, and I don't know about you but I'm tired of getting pulled and yanked around. So you would just propose then that we conjure up the way to do long form magic out of the air then? That there is no other way to find that? I propose that we at least put boots to ground and get moving. Gav, this is putting bo boots to ground. This is how we find information. Once we mine a collection like this, who knows what jewels and resources there are here? We have to spend more time in this place in order to help Basil. If we want to move forward, the best way to do that is to take a look at where we are and learn more. We can't help Basil with the information we have right now. There could be people out there that we're, there not, being, be. we're not going to be talking to. There's going to be... We don't have... We have the illusion of time. We don't actually have that much. There is a greater enemy that's out there that is still hunting us. They don't know. know where we are anymore, but we can still get them before they get us. And you just want to sit here and look around for spells. No, the things that we need might be here. Things that explain the unexplainable. Things that... I need to learn more about weapons. You need to learn about weapons. Yeah. You're not going to find that necessarily in just a book. But here there are so many books. There's more of a chance of finding it here than there I'm... is by stumbling into the right person by happenstance out in the world. I'm not saying that we use happenstance. What I'm saying is that we spend too much time looking for answers just in books. Look, I know that you're a scholar and I am never going to understand you and these rules and this place. I'm very aware of that. And I'm pretty sure I know that I'm very terribly ignorant about a great many things here in this actuality. And I don't care. What I do understand is there's an enemy out there and they are going to kill us. So we need to kill them before they can. That's 
I do understand. But do and we I know anything about the enemy? What do I we know? I know they want us enemy? dead. I know they want Twig dead. Maurice just says, Jaren the Devoured, and Maurice is moving King, like going back moves in the game, like resetting two moves back and, and looking at the. Jaren yeah. is certainly our enemy, but I, I don't think Jaren is our only enemy. No, this whole world is. There's something that's being concealed from all of us. We all know this. Basil pretty much told us that. That's in the war documents. And the only way to get the war report is to help Basil. And yes. he looks it's up from hot. he looks up from a table where he's been studying um, many of these tomes and says that's correct, and looks back. It's not polite to interrupt conversations you're not a part of, Basil Victorium. It's not polite to be discussed in the third person either. Oh, shut up. You can always cut off your ears, then you won't have to hear it. Just because we're doing this for you doesn't mean I have to like you. At this point, <clears throat> Twig rolls in, and I'm, uh, so you see, you see them waving with a pretty hefty volume, and just, and it's just like, I'm not entirely sure what this means, and you can kind of see emblazoned across the front, it just says, metaphysical ballistics. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I feel like this is relevant to someone, but I'm not sure how or whom or why. Um, and uh, I, I would also like to uh, basically walk right up to Basil and just be like, I don't suppose in your infinite wisdom, you know who the mother gun is. And he ponders for a moment. And he says, there are a great many topics I do not have a, a keen grasp on, but this I do know well. Jiren, while not a goetic, makes the use of many different demonic figures, henchmen, if you will. Um, the Mother Gun is a formidable adversary in her own right, more so made more so by the efforts of her children, her bullets. Um, this I know is that she has performed several operations for Jiren in the past, involving everything from manipulation, keen to what almost happened with you with the dispatching of the tracer bullet, I believe. And then finally, I believe that uh, there are some of her children that she uses to quite simply dispatch her adversaries. How do you know about that? One must learn to survive in the actuality when one has no means of friendship or family or any knowledge of their origins. I'm sure all of you have had to go to similar lengths. Yes, let me play you a song on the world's smallest violin to highlight my sympathy. I did not <laughs> ask for your sympathy, Gabrielle. I am simply stating a fact. What is elementary? Look, all of you are very smart. I get that. You want to stick your head in books, you're going to find all of the answers, but you're only going to find part of it. I've been waiting here too long. And quite frankly, there are things that I could do that I don't need to stay here for. Has no one ever told you, Gabrielle, that knowledge is power? Many times, but I'm a soldier, so I don't really care. Let me just... I have to tell you, my mind races with all of the possibilities. I never thought I might see the interior of this library. I thought far enough ahead, but I couldn't see the shape of what plans might come to fruition through the access to this place. And now the possibilities are endless. It is not well organized, but already you have some interesting volume. May I see that? And he points to the uh, metaphysical um, ballistics book. I toss is a very gentle word. Uh, it's not like a thrown book at his head, but it's close. Yeah, oh, like he... it's just like if if you fuck uh, fuck this up, it's gonna hit you in the face, kind of throw. Mm -hmm. Yeah, He's, that. Uh, being hyper observant, he kind of notices, but still kind of being very. Uh, lean, just... <clears throat> uh, 
and he opens the book and begins rifling through, puts his finger on an interesting passage, and flips again, and looks to you, Gavrielle, and says, this actually might be of some use to you. Uh, this is um, some sort of enchantment. Um, it deals with the consecration of weapons. Um, a fully constructed weapon required, made of materials. Uh, oil of Akron. Uh, 30 minutes preparation, one hour performance. Um, a weapon that you can hold in your hands becomes enchanted with power, sacred to your practice. Until the next sun rises, the weapon has an enchantment placed upon it to make it that much more formidable in combat. This is an example of power. I'm sure if one were to look and he closes the book and throws it back to you gingerly. To me? Uh, no, to Twig. Okay. Says, if one I'll, were... I'll just, I, Twig just kind of catches it and just flicks it in um, Gab's direction. <laughs> yeah. I, ima I imagine Carrie is about to have a goddamn heart attack. But... <laughs> yes. <laughs> and he... Be careful with that. <laughs> <laughs> he, he looks at you, Gabrielle, and says, this is an example of a, a means by which you can impose more of your will upon the world. That has to tell you how important this moment is, this place is. There seems to be a misunderstanding here. You think that I want to impose my will on the world. You think that I want some form of power. You've misunderstood me entirely. I mean, the ability to impose your will on the world insofar as you feel like you can change the outcome of your own life, which is apparent to me that you don't feel like you have. I don't understand my life here. I barely understand everybody else's in this world. And sitting around in a library for me, is not going to bring me that. But Gav, don't you understand that the only way to find these things out is by looking for the written record of people who do remember. People who remembered so well that they put that information on paper, that they documented it for the written historical record so that whatever happened during the war and before it never happens again. But the only way to access that knowledge is to go and find what those people wrote because no one out there, and Kiri stops and just gesticulates wildly to the outside. No one out there remembers, no one. Books are the only chance we have of having some sort of connection to that past. Maurice scoots his chair back loudly and says, I wouldn't trust necessarily anything I read in these books. It's my trade to lie in the written word. I'd say I half. I, I would say half that, of this is false. I cannot believe that of all the people here, you're the one that's closest to agreeing with me. Why do you think that it could be lies? This Everything is, is a lie. These are scholarly works. If there's the one thing that I have learned in my brief time here, it is that everything that anyone here has ever shown me has just been deeper into the lie. We came from a lie. Everything around us can't suddenly be true. I don't believe that. Yes, and this is why the whole point of my research is to prove that this world is a lie. You can't live your life based on research. But research is the way that we prove what we think we know. Or you just write it down in a book and someone believes it and use it as part of their thesis. Unless it's peer reviewed. Look, we're not getting anywhere. We're arguing in circles and we're just going to keep doing it. You want everything to be categorized, easy, findable, put it on a shelf, examine it at your leisure. You cannot examine the fact that we are in some form of a conspiracy here and that we might have an opportunity to break it wide open. You're not going to find that in the book. But Gav, the way to break it wide open is to learn it so well that you can beat it. Because then you learn the loopholes, then you know what they don't want you to find. And when you do that, 
you can open the world. You can break it wide open and see who built this ridiculous machine that they want us to think is the end of the tunnel, but isn't. There's something in Kiri's voice that a conviction you haven't heard before. I don't think you really need to understand how a machine works to break it. Most, most complex, the more complex things are, and the most complex things this is true for, can be destroyed or stopped or halted by fairly simple actions. How was your life in Shadow, Kitty? Comfortable? Nice? Went to school? Maurice is paying attention closely for the first time. Did you have a, did you have like a cushy little life? I can tell by your voice. With the posh accent. Curious. Your dresses, your fancy way of speaking and working through the world like everybody is just going to give you exactly what you want if you say the right words, if you learn enough, if you're good enough. And that's not the world that I came from. It doesn't matter how smart you are. It doesn't matter how tough you are. It doesn't matter what you're willing to put up with. It doesn't matter who you kill. What do you know about being good enough, Gav? I don't know anything about it. Has it never mattered? Then maybe take it from someone who and Kiri, for the first time, you're hearing a bit of emotion in her voice, and she, as a Stoic, is not someone who emotes easily or readily, and yet here she is. You know what my life in the gray was? My life in the gray was just me struggling against people who thought they knew where my place in this world was, in that world was, and it wasn't ever with a life of the mind. I fought in my own way. Maybe not with weapons, maybe not on a battlefield, but I fought for what I got, for every little bit of research, for the opportunity, and she gestures to the bookshelves around her, the waterfall, the trees. I just, I, I fought for the chance to have something like this every day, for the chance to be taken seriously in scholarship, for the chance to have a place in this world, in this world of the mind. That was my life in the gray. Well, congratulations. It looks like you got what you wanted. But Did some I? of us have yet to even find just one shred of that. And I think at this point, Gav is, is not directly angry at you. That's not really the, quite the look that's in her eyes. It's just, she registers that and there's like a little bit of a short nod of respect about that. Like she can understand the struggle, mm. but at the same time, like she's just, she just is not going to get through to you in the way that she wants to, because words are not her forte. Right. And in that frustration, she just sort of like gives like her head a final shake and walks away. And I think walks towards the library doors and, and says, I'm leaving. I can't stay here. I can't, I can't just bury myself in research in a book and pray that I'm going to find something. Where I come from, you have to be more proactive. And maybe it is in a book, maybe it's not. But right now, the one thing that I can understand and that I do understand is that there is a man out there with way more power than any of us whose name was the only name in my file that might have some connection to something about me, about this world. And I have to find it. And Basil, having watched all of this unfold, stands up and says, very well. I'll escort you to your means of egress, then, if that is truly what you wish. Maurice pockets the testament and sets Duncan down off his lap and says uh, to Kiri, some of us need to write our own story now. I'm going with her. I think Gav is actually shocked she was not expecting anybody to do that. And Basil 
looks at you very just absolutely looking you up and down you remember exactly that same appraising look during your last confrontation where you kind of tried to you know brute force any information out of him this cipher mm -hmm. and um he looks at you and says very well I assume we'll need both of your participation when we do find the ritual. I would uh, appreciate your assistance, Father. He says to Maurice. And then Maurice to, bristles at this. And, yeah. He says, very well, follow me. And he begins walking out of the library. Maurice steals a glance at Twig. Twig is visibly upset, but trying to kind of torn, like, uh, they agree with everybody. They think oh, they think that they, there's answers here and the knowledge is tantalizing, but like, you know, action is necessary and watching these, this divisiveness and the only structure that they have in their life is mildly at, at the very least devastating like you can tell twigs like kind of trying not to not necessarily cry but trying to hold it together and not doing a great job of it Maurice breaks eye contact and walks out with Gav and you follow Basil um, Kiri how does you're kind of left with twig in this library and you know what are you thinking as they walk out here is watching the door and watches as it swings shut behind gavin maurice and there's almost something in her eyes that just closes when the door closes too like something's been confirmed like she was expecting this. She was expecting the second she felt at home, no one would want to be there with her. No one would tolerate doing something for her. And I think at the same time, she's feeling a pull to exit the library with them and she doesn't know why. She looks back at all the books around her, behind her, the wealth of materials that it's now her job to classify. As a first assistant librarian at the library on campus, you know, she wasn't the chief librarian. She was a part of a bigger structure. And here, almost as Maurice has said, she has a chance to write her own story in her career. This library poses that opportunity. But these people she's been traveling with, something's pulling her towards them too. But that second of, of, of not knowing if she should stay or go as the door closes, she turns away and goes back to the books. And we're going to follow Gabrielle and Maurice. You are walking down the halls of the Candle Flame Keep, and... You finally, after just a couple of minutes of walking, you retrace your steps back to the throne room of King Nine. And um, at which point, Basil kind of straightens himself a little bit more, uh, anticipating this upcoming confrontation or whatever this encounter is likely to be and steps into the throne room and you hear that same cavernous powerful voice from the throne as you enter oh leaving so soon did you not find what you were looking for i take it we found yeah. it was time to go <laughs> very well i have uh means of shortening your trip and he claps and a gentleman walks in 
And the only reason you know that this is a male figure or is a very masculine shaped lacune. Um, broad shoulders. But at the same time, you know, just very kind of muscular physique. Striding with a purpose into the throne room. But like all lacune, the shape of this person is basically a hole in reality. And through which this silhouette, you see a bustling corner in what can only be far town, populated by numerous Vizle walking back and forth. And you see them pass in and out of your view through the silhouette of this person. And finally, King Nine looks to the Lacune and says, Mr. Yanish, if you would be so kind as to let these three use your passage back to Saturine, you can let your brother know to be amenable should they wish to return. And I do so hope they will. And he looks at you, and there's a slight hint of a smirk underneath those coal smoldering eyes. And mysteriously, or, or funnily enough, Yanish replies with a very kind of matter of fact tone Absolutely. I assume Visley will be going to Far Town then. And looks. You can't really see the Lucune's eyes, but you can feel his stare at you, his kind of expectant waiting look. Maurice looks at Gavin. Yeah, I think she also gives you a nod, just like, yeah, let's do this. And um, Basil looks to each of you and says, I will not be coming back with you, but should you wish to speak? I will be here. Good luck finding us. And he sniffs and um, turns, starts heading back to the library. Uh, meanwhile, the lacune gestures for you guys to step forward and offers a hand. Maurice takes it. And he says, very well, step through. And he gestures your foot to step into his chest. Maurice, uh, with his free hand, picks up Duncan All right. and steps through. And like basically walking through a curtain, you feel a rush of air and uh, just kind of like the pressure changing from this warm, um, very uh, not balmy, but dry candle flame keep. And you suddenly hear the thrum of far town around you in the middle of the day deep breath relief and at which point um Janish looks at you gabrielle and says so will you be going to the same place then yes i i will very well and he once again gestures uh, his hand with his hand as if to signal that he's willing to give you a boost. Before I take it, I think Gav like has this half second where she turns around and and stares at the empty spaces behind her, kind of wondering if Twig or uh, Kiri are going to show up behind her, but sees that nobody's there. Gives like Basil a very hard look grabs Yanish's hand is just like one way or the other I'm going to see what's in that report and um, Basil looks at you and says I know you will I trust you to do the right thing and uh, she steps through yeah. and you find yourself standing next to um, Maurice uh, with Duncan in arm uh, this bustling far town um, street um, 
just kind of everybody coming and going. It's not very far, you think, from your shared uh, apartment. Uh, at the same time, nobody, everybody is completely oblivious because basically everybody is kind of traveling through some manner of uh, strange Vizlay operated um, device or mechanism or artifice or magic. Um, so it's just a thrumming street. And which point you notice um, behind you uh, another lacune, uh, definitely less like built in the shoulders, mm -hmm. uh, and just said, um, so, uh, I suppose I'll be here. Um, suppose you've met my brother. <laughs> I'm Grogan, and, um, <laughs> and he nod nods and says, um, just simply, I'll, I typically tend to stay here. And he points to, uh, a small tavern, um, just on the corner of the street. Um, it's the corner of, uh, Divinity and, uh, Unite Road. So, at that point, it just says, I have rooms above. I am here on business. It's my understanding. If you went here via my brother, that you mm -hmm. might have further need of me. Maurice smiles and gives him a firm handshake and says, thank you very much. Yeah. What was that street corner again? Divinity and... Uh, Divinity and Unite Road. Right. Divinity. Quest instructions. What was the suffix on divinity? <laughs> uh, divinity. I'm gonna say uh, divinity way. So Maurice uh, sees one of his favorite uh, tobacconists, mm -hmm. and and happily sets Duncan on the ground. Uh, he, uh, he he looks at Gav and says, "Civilization again," and and walks up and uh, proceeds to buy some pipe tobacco. <laughs> I think Gav is just like. Mm, what? <laughs> um, it's clearly gonna follow, obviously. She's like, wait, wait, wait. You stole him out of King Nine's library with me to go buy cigarettes? Oh, you stormed out. I just followed. Uh, I'm out of pipe tobacco, so I'm buying some. And uh, and looking over the stack, Marie says, uh, and uh, I'm gonna treat myself and uh, buy some of the more expensive stuff. So Gav, Gav is like in the shop with you and just, just like, sw like as you're like grabbing stuff off the shelf, she's like constantly like swiveling around to like make sure she's like in your face to like have this conversation be like, wait, so why did you follow me? I'm, well, I wanted to do something and now it looks like we're going home and then we can do something else later, but I don't want to stay there. Oh, we're not going home, Maurice. I am going to track Jaren before he can track us again. Okay. Are you going to be okay with this? I have never been able to stop you before. <laughs> no, but you've never really come with me on something like this before either. Yeah, I'm a Western right now. I mean, look, why, I, can, I can meet you up later. Why do you... Why do you stay around any of us? Why do you stay around me? Why have you stayed with me for this long? I mean, you're like me. You came back, and despite all of the tips and tricks and best practices, our previous lives didn't appear. You needed a home. I gave you my couch. I would help you as I'd help anyone else. I mean, not anyone else. I, uh, I do care for you grown fond of you. <laughs> it's not like I haven't... I'm not ungrateful for that hospitality. I don't really know where else I would have gone. But things are going to happen a lot faster now. And... Look, I know I'm not the easiest person to get along with. I know I'm me, but this is what we're going to do, what we might have to do, what I might have to do. You've not seen this from me before. And Maurice puts a hand on your shoulder and says, and I might have to do what I have to do. 
Gav is like, is that a threat or is that support? It's neither. It's maybe our paths are no longer the same. And that's okay. We can be true to ourselves, write our own stories. It's yeah. just not the same one anymore. Well, you're the better writer than I am. But the conviction. <laughs> Look, I followed you. Well, let's put it that way. I might right. follow you again. Um, but I'm going to go home. Okay. Well, I know where you are. Right. And is that I'm not actually leaving the city anytime right. soon. Right. I mean, nothing's fucked, right? Oh, everything's fucked. <laughs> right. Oh. <sighs> what do you think the others are going to do? I don't know. I think if people want to get in touch, they will. We'll find a way. I honestly this this shadow we're in mm. it's the safest I've felt in a week that's good that's good um, I'm not worried about you or Twig or Kiri or the, those that want to find us can't and if we want to find each other I, I believe we can and I wish I had your conviction in destiny, the same way you seem to about all of us. No, that's that's the thing. And Maurice uh, pays for the tobacco and, and they walk out of the store. Yeah. That's the thing. We make our own destiny. And when you don't like the ending, you write your own. You erase it and make your own truth. That's what all this is. I think she adjusts her rifle on her back Make your own destiny. I like that. Right now I'm going to start with getting this motherfucker off of our backs and finding out why it is that he seems to know all of us and we can't remember him. You know where to find me. You sure you don't want to come right away? I'm sure. All right. Take care of yourself. Big Are you leaving it for hug now? She's like, oh God. Too <laughs> late. Too late. <laughs> All right. We go into action mode for now. <laughs> <We're waiting. laughs> uh, yeah, actually. Um, no, I let it happen. I let it happen. All right. I uh, I was going to say, don't worry. I wasn't going to make you fight. <laughs> but um, I will say... Um, we are going to rejoin uh, the two uh, in the middle of the library. And before we do that, I'm going to draw another card. This one is the Whispering Lover. It is color, it, it accentuates the gray sun and it diminishes the indigo sun. Meanings, love, romance, partnerships, loved ones, relationships. Love represents the strongest of, bond, strongest of bonds, romance, family, and deep friendship. The intimacy inherent in the whispers of a lover is rare and valuable. We seek love, and once we have it, we fight to keep it. The whispering lover represents those people in our lives that are most important to us. It doesn't have to suggest romance. There are many kinds of positive relationships one can have in their life. Um, and I think that this is interesting, um, just because I think two things happen which is that first off i think that it's a little reassuring for you kiri to know that you know twig hasn't left um probably you don't know how long that like is a certainty but you know for a fact that it gives you as hard as it is it does give you some measure of comfort and at the same time i think that the card is very interesting and reflective because at some point, while Basil has rejoined all of you and is researching, Avalia arrives at the doorway, you know, leading into this vast library, and you hear a knock on the wood, uh, one of the trunks of uh, the tree shelves in the library, 
At which point, he looks to all of you and both of you and says, "Excuse me," and he leaves to join her momentarily. What are you guys doing? I think, Twig, what you see is, you know, Kiri's gone back to her pile of books. Um, she's gone back to things that aren't books. In fact, you know, there's um, rare botanical carving cuttings. Uh, there's even some things that are what we would see as alive. I think there might be, you know, some creatures here and there that she's studying, looking at as they kind of prowl around up around the tops of the shelves and some of the foliage. Um, but you see Twig no sign of Kiri's earlier emotion. Um, her mouth is sort of set in a thin line. Her face is a mask of neutrality and focus. Um, the books have always been her life and it's better that way. Of course it's better that way. It always has been for her. And so she's, you know, she, I think, looked at you after Gav and Maurice left and kind of made eye contact for a second. And you may have seen just a little spark of, of something, but she went quickly back over to what she was doing, facing the mammoth task before her, pulling books off of shelves, reading, taking notes. Yeah. Taking... <laughs> Twig is definitely like, well, that's a coping mechanism um, in in their head. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think Twig is just kind of um, wander, like almost like, you know, you know that thing when you're kind of distressed and you're too stressed out to really hold on to any one thought twig just kind of putters around this entry area by this pool for a little bit and just kind of observes and watches and then finally af after basil um exits uh he his presence is um his his absence is just like kind of enough to of a reduction in stress that twig just kind of goes, all right, I need to, I need to do the thing. And, um, you see twig just kind of walk back into these, uh, this forest of stacks. Um, before you go to the forest, I am going to say there is actually a flash of red catches your eye and you realize very quickly, you see it in the pool that you are about to leave and this glimmer of red kind of catches it and I'd actually like you to roll a perception check for me yeah okay cool I'm gonna definitely have my dice with me <laughs> I definitely didn't leave those in the other room I have a dice roller um <laughs> all right uh perception um I'll throw a Bene at that. Yeah, and I'll give you plus one to your venture for this as well. Oh, yeah. I think I might actually be like, is that my jam? I forget. <laughs> I think you do have some, uh, I think, a perception bonus. Yeah. Bag of wine. Bag of wine. Um, where the fuck are my skills? Where my skills at, yo? <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, now I have I have it for searching. I think which... this would uh, this might count actually. Okay. Uh, uh, D ten five on the die. Okay. Uh, so with the two, um, that's a seven. I think that's more than enough. You take a sharper look at it. You're expecting kind of like a stone or something, and it's definitely like a lacquered surface. But you realize mm. very quickly in the shimmer of the water it's a title in gold on a lacquered book cover you don't think it's too far to reach down and pick it up but you are not certain i was, I was about to say how deep is this pool say about you know it's really kind of in the shallow side of this kind of like the beginning of this miniature lake or pond uh it's probably about three or four feet down I'm just, I'll definitely trundle right on into the water. Um, I'm kind of very single mindedly. Magpie, shiny, shiny, shiny has attracted my interest. Um, 
And uh, as you enter the pool, you feel this kind of warm sensation of it as if it's almost heated, probably by the same candle flame that is suffusing the keep um, to some degree. And that vex that you had heals. Ooh, fancy. Uh, yeah, and before you know it, you're kind of standing over this volume. All right, I will scoop this out of the water. And you take a look at this book and you kind of push aside the water droplets as it kind of drips off. It seems to be very kind of lacquered and kind of water re resistant. You don't know why it's in the pool, but the title is very clear to you. It says, I am the weapon, a practical treatise on the application of blood magic. Well, hello. Yeah, and it's it's almost like as a reminder, like you you kind of like your wound doesn't necessarily hurt, and but it for some reason it's like I think probably wading into the water, you feel uh, the cloth of your clothing kind of rub against the tender uh, opening of that. I will. Um... I think that I'm going to say that technically it requires conscious action, but I think that um, this just the stress and all of the um, energy and like just this this buildup of emotion. Um, Twig basically just consumes the text using my logovore ability, just kind of on just out of out of impulse without actually thinking about it. So you consume the text. Mm-hmm. All right. Um, I would like... Are you going to try to do this stealthily away from Kiri? No. No. Okay. I'm not... I'm not... I'm not try, like, I'm not thinking about it. I'm just... I just hopped into the water. I picked up this book, and then I'm just like, oh, shit. All right. So, you learn several things. One of which is a secret. It is called... If I can find it... I believe it is called Blood as Power. You can draw from your own physical essence to power your spells. If you are cut or have an open wound, you can use physicality in place of sorcery to cast your spells. So dope. Yeah. You also learn two skills. Some of the water has damaged the text, but you do kind of have the... Uh, means of kind of salvaging two of the intended um, spells within this volume. Why don't you describe them for us? Ah, indeed. Um, so these two spells, um, one is titled uh, My Body is a Weapon. Um, and for those of us keeping track about rule type stuff, it is a level four spell of the green um, magic school. And it is, I create a weapon that can be wielded with one hand at the, from my blood. Um, I, I take one vex to physicality and uh, in addition to the sorcery cost or physicality cost with this, with that secret. Um, and it depletes uh, on a zero at the start of each day. Uh, as well, I believe um, I can create a one-handed weapon that it it appears to be a weapon of a, you know whatever type I'm looking to create, but it's just um, shimmers with this sanguine. It's almost like somebody took the concept of blood and hardened it into this solid mass and then forged a weapon from it. It's so cool. Hell yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and you realize as you kind of absorb that one spell that that lacquer that is on the book is probably made from hardened blood. Mm. That seems unsanitary, but okay. Um, <laughs> and what's the second spell? <laughs> and the second spell is called, just titled in Kindle. And it is a level six spell. It is also green, um, and it requires me to spend some of my life to give life to an inanimate, inanimate object or plant, something that does not have its own sentience. And 
I take some of my life energy and grant it. And I give sentience or at least consciousness to a, something small, a small creature or a thing. And it, uh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, as you kind of absorb this knowledge and devour it, um, you know, instinctually, you watch as the volume, the blood hardens, uh, turns brown, crumbles and falls into the water. The paper dissolving with it. Does Kiri see any of this? Make a perception roll. Right. I'm going to add a Bene to it. I, I think am... she'd be particularly sensitive at the moment to things in this collection and her responsibility to them. I am also going to pull a card if you'd like to wait. Okay, yeah, go for it. Yeah. Pull a card first. All right. Uh, let's see. This one is the cat. Notions, cats, <laughs> clocks, and wind. Companion, solitude, curiosity, cleverness, and dexterity. Cats, oh boy. Cats. Yes. Yeah, the cats see much. They prowl about or simply find a good vantage point and watch and sleep. Should something really catch their eye, however, they move to investigate. Curiosity killed the cat, as the saying goes, and it's true. But cats have nine lives, and thus they can afford a little curiosity. The cat is the companion of the Notions family. It watches over them and sometimes even protects them. So um, I'm going to say, you know, I'm going to... I just want to point out, Inculpable Aura is still active. All right. So in that case, so yeah. It provides one hindrance on anybody trying to figure out whether I'm to blame for something. All right. Who's, uh, who's Notions Cast Clocks and Win again? That's me. <laughs> and I am solitary right now. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's really interesting because that's going to... I believe come into play for not only Gabrielle but also for Kiri. Amazing. Uh, yeah. Uh, it's like we're bookending mm. our polar opposites. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> Kiri, I'm gonna say I'm gonna say that you, because of this heightened awareness, typically you would have one to your venture, but because of the inculpable aura, you are hindered one, so it negates. So okay. make that perception roll after all. Okay. And I can't add a Bene then? Uh you can if you'd like. Uh I'm gonna say that your challenge rating is uh six i think twigs back is to you um he's standing over uh they. a pool yeah yeah okay i will add a benny i think okay <laughs> and that's a seven. Oh boy yeah you you see what can only be vellum pages dissolve in water Ooh, vellum. The uh, mask of neutrality instantly evaporates and Kiri runs over to you where you are in a desperate effort to try to catch some of the vellum before it falls into the water. You're still wearing a fancy dress, right? Oh, yes. So yes. I'm in the water. Um, I'm like four feet, or I'm like three or four, three feet deep in the water, mm -hmm. Zach. Yeah, yeah. So you just like run into this, into this little pond. Oh, I'm like diving into the pond. That's what's gonna happen here. Yeah, that's I an image. I think, yeah, you dive into the pond and uh, you are just kind of like skimming uh, along the kind of like the surface, three, four feet. You seem to see a pearlescent um, kind of reflective surface staring back at you. And maybe it's the water. or Maybe it's a trick of your imagination. Maybe it's the panic you find yourself in. But you can swear to God, it's like your reflections looking back at you. Oof. Do she's I... gonna kind of look at that for a second like that's gonna put stop her in her tracks almost i mean she's gathering as much as she can of like the soggy vellum scraps of blank paper in this like desperate bid to save it but even that is kind of paused by her own reflection catching her eye in a way that isn't exactly, as you say, just a reflection of her, but almost as if it's its own being. Yeah, it's, uh, it does not move. And then you actually see something else, um, a, a kind of a curve around your reflection. Hmm. As you realize it seems to be a long cylindrical object that is reflecting your visage back at you. 
Kiri's going to reach for her reflection. Your hand meets a solid glass surface. And you recognize the shape. It appears to be a, a sort here as you kind of pull it out of the water. Hmm. It is... Very Lady of the Lake. It is made... It is... You would think it would be glass, but it is a mirrored sort here. Kiri kind of draws it slowly out of the water, almost watching as the, the tip and the water separate, almost as if they were made of the same liquidy substance and then suddenly break from each other, as though the sortier almost was made from the water, a part of the water until the very moment that she pulled it out. Yeah. And Book, at this point, completely forgotten. She just stares at it and sees her reflection mirrored in the mirrored glass of the sortier in front of her. I'd like you to make a resistance roll as you forget to breathe. <laughs> All right. <laughs> uh, this is just literally, this is going to be a three. Okay. And that's a one. <laughs> so. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, Twig, you're standing over Kiri and you hear. <laughs> and you realize so, Kiri hasn't come up for air for a I'm few. I'm looking, yeah, I'm looking down and like I'm holding whatever scraps of soggy ugh, skin that I can hold. <laughs> oh God, Vellum, so gross. Anyways, um, Twig definitely is just gonna reach in and grab, uh, I don't know, whatever, back of the dress, scruff, whatever. Um, and uh, I mean, we just, are talking about cats. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and just I'm just gonna scruff Carrie and pull her up out of the water. What are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> like I, I realize. Look, I'm sorry. I realize the book got destroyed. Not a reason to drown yourself. <laughs> Not a good reason to drown yourself. Carrie's almost like coming out of a trance. But when she does, it kind of snaps instantly. She looks at you, and her face is a whirlwind of fury. What did you do? What I, on earth could have compelled you to eat something in here, Twig? Well, Don't I you know that King Nine has entrusted me with this library? I can make it again. At least the bits that were still there. It was made out of blood, wasn't it? There's blood spooling around here in this water. Can you no, write no, it th in that's, blood? That's from me, actually. <laughs> Sorry, that's a little bit of a... little bit of a biohazard. If I get sick, it's your fault. I'm pretty healthy, other than the missing heart thing. Can we get back to the point at hand here, which is that you ate a book out of King Nine's library, a book that King Nine will hold me accountable for? What on earth could have possessed you to do this? Twig's backing away a little, like, slowly, back, very slowly, because I'm in fucking water, um, backing away. Just well, like, the... I, didn't, I didn't mean to. Kiri, I'm sorry. I did not mean to. I'm sorry. The image you see is of a woman in a long 30s dress with puff peak shoulders, dripping wet long hair, brandishing a mirrored sortier at you as though it was like a baton that a professor was waving at an errant student, looking all the picture of a drowned mad woman meets the lady of the lake. <laughs> A twig just like is just backing slowly away. <laughs> I can't believe you. Do you what was this book called? Do you even know? And she grasps handfuls of the soggy vellum and starts throwing them in the air around her as though it was like dripping gross mushy confetti. It's gone. It's gone now. It's absolutely gone. And what are you going to do about it? Nothing. You just get to eat it and walk away like you I, always do. I can write it. I can write it back out. I remember everything except for. Do you? Zach. I don't remember the name of the book off the top of my head, Zach. Uh, yeah, no, you you would remember everything about this book. Yeah, I have I have a literally creepily weird, good, weirdly good memory. Um, and I I just start so it, it twigs just like kind of like visibly freaking out, backing out, hands, hands up, just, and I'm just going to start reciting from the opening page to into the, like the contents and then the chapter and like chapter one title. And just like, I'm going to keep repeating the things that I just ate 
it, as I slowly back away from Kiri. Kiri, I think... the level of scholarship with which he is panically reciting Lee. They, res, but... uh, they pardon me. Uh, they are panically, uh, panickedly reciting to you is pretty good. Pretty good. They are, they're definitely uh, doing uh, their best. <laughs> so she's a little surprised by how good it is, I think. And so that almost like takes her down a notch. But when she hears the title, the title, or at least the, the first part of the title was I Am The Weapon, mm -hmm. she's going to kind of be still as though like all this energy around her rage that you destroyed in her vision, in her estimation, this book, just sort of stops. What did you say the name of the title was again? I Am The Weapon. The Practical Treatise on Blood Magic. I Am The Weapon? And for a second, you just see a flash of something. Kiri looks scared, but it's gone. It's fleeting. Well, amidst all this other stuff, I the, the other emotional <laughs> and deranged, drowned cat waving a mirrored sword in a 30s dress. I, I know you're not actually a cat, but um, <laughs> I, I was just going to let that one pass. <laughs> uh, does... Mm -hmm, go ahead. I was going to ask, does the sortie respond at all to my heightened state or no? Actually make a perception roll. Okay. Don't like that. Uh, just <laughs> straight. You can add a bene if you like. All right. I'll add a bene. And that's a nine plus one is ten. <laughs> yeah, I think you catch yourself looking into the mirrored sort here and you are looking at your eyes and they're looking back at you and one of them winks. Don't like that. Sorry. <laughs> She's going to go a little bit more pale than she currently is, but I think that's enough to sort of calm her down out of rage book librarian mode and i think uh i think that is a good spot for us uh to take a five ten minute break uh Damn. let's get back at six ten uh thanks for everybody who's joining us uh we will guys see you guys in a minute uh take a bio break grab something to eat uh we'll be back with the second half of our story where we'll pick up with uh, the other half of our um bislay momentarily Stay tuned. Oh boy. <laughs> I'll be eating cheese. <laughs> oh my God. Um, and welcome back, everybody. Uh, joining us uh, again now that uh, the break is done. Uh, if uh, you guys are just tuning in, uh, some really interesting stuff has been happening with our uh, uh, wonderful, friendly Vizlay. They have, in effect, I hate to say this phrase lightly, they have split the party. And now uh, everybody's kind of trying to go back about their businesses, uh, businesses pre-meeting each other. And we're going to see how well that works out. Uh, I say um, pre-meeting each other, but in this case, we are going to be opening with Gabrielle. Gabrielle, hey. you have made your, uh, you've kind of like established your objective. You would like yep. to uh, seek out... Jiren the Devoured. I would indeed. And let's see about setting the tone here. And tell me exactly how it is you intend to go about doing that. So the one thing that Gav is confident in her abilities of, it is tracking. Mm -hmm. um, she knows a bit more than what she started out with, obviously even having the name makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. um, she now knows that Jaren is an immediate rival to King Nine and has some of her own underworld connections from odd jobs she's done in the past year in the actuality. Mm -hmm. So with a bit of hidden knowledge, which I've never used before, so this is going to be fun. Mm -hmm. um, so it says here on my sheet to get technical for people who may not know what we're talking about. Like me, um, I have 13 hidden knowledge. Does this mean I pull one of them? Uh, you burn one of them. It is okay. a non-renewable resource. You yes, it is. You get it through role play. Um, but essentially what you do when you burn um, hidden knowledge 
is you essentially tell me how it is you are adding a point to your venture. Like, what knowledge do you bring to the table that allows you to have additional insight into this action? So I think this has something to do with some of her mercenary odd jobs that she's done. Um, maybe one of those clients or even somebody she was supposed to bring in mm -hmm. knows something that at first didn't, wouldn't have really registered. Maybe one of them was like pleading for their life or something like that and mentioned Jiren, but mm -hmm. that wouldn't have registered beforehand. So maybe in like one Mark's uh, desperate babbling, they spilled some sort of uh, neighborhood or safe house, some piece of information that can lead Gav to the correct district or in the general vicinity of some something where she could find something more to start her tracking. Okay, so what I'm going to do then is, I believe you already have a, a, a single point of contact as well, don't you? Um, in uh, your, to Jiren? Not to Jiren, but uh, kind of like within your kind of background. Uh, uh, do, do you have a connection? Connection? I mean, I just don't know in which which way do you mean like connection. Like somebody you know from your work, because that may have been part of character creation. If not, uh, it's Ooh, fine. It's we're just... going to go way back to my notes, aren't we? That's going to be fun. <laughs> Let's see what I got. Okay. Hey, Zach, quick question while we're looking at notes. Um, Thank you, talk. <laughs> how many How many hidden knowledge can you use at any given time? One plus one Bene. Only one hidden knowledge at a time. Mm -hmm. I do not believe there are actually any character secrets you can have that allow you to spend more than one at a time. Uh, if there I have are, not seen any. Uh, if there are, I haven't found them, but at the same time... You know, it's a fairly nice uh, limited resource, but you guys should be spending them like uh, Tic Tacs, honestly. I, so, yeah, I have so many. Mm -hmm. Also, yeah. spending like Tic Tacs is a weird phrase and I object to it. Yeah, that, that's my fault. <laughs> spending like bottle caps. Uh, yes, Marcy. Um, I'm not seeing a name and I don't wish to... Um... Stall for All time. Right. Um, I'm sure it is in here, and if so, I will recap. I know I have somebody that sends me out on assignments. We've never actually ever seen them in the show before. Excellent. Okay, in that case, what I would like you to do is I think from off the bat, you know which district it is. What I'd like you to roll for mm -hmm. is to get what level of information you need to know. Okay. Like, that, like what additional information you need to know about kind of like this trip. Great. Okay. So what's the venture on that? And what could I add to that? Is it just the hidden knowledge that's giving me the plus? Yeah, it's the hidden knowledge. Uh, I'm going to give you one venture because this is your profession. Okay. Um, so you're going to have two. W depending on how well you do, um, your your target is six. So four and above. Uh, you're going to have a probably a mixed success with your venture no matter what. But um, past a certain threshold, you're going to get some in uh, interesting int uh, uh, additional info. Okay, uh, five. Okay, so plus the two is seven, right? Oh, I thought I thought that was just the. Uh, didn't you? You said it was starting out as six, and then you were adding the two, so that it would be a four that I would hit. Uh, well, did you roll a five on the die? Yeah. Then you you had you met the threshold. You hit your venture was two to start, so you needed to hit. Um, oh. Yeah, yeah. Gotcha. Um. So yeah. So with a seven. Um, basically what happens is not only do you know, uh, somebody that you should talk to, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, you know exactly where you would want to go if you were hiring mercenaries or people who had direct contact with something like this. Um, okay. basically the person who sent you, I think the thing that's most important to you is not the mark necessarily, but the person who sent you to find the mark. Uh, was a person by the name of uh, Oja Kilendaris. Um, Ooh, let's spell that name. That is O-J-A Kai, uh, Kai K, I'm, I was about to say Kylo Ren. Uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> K-I-L E-N D-A-R-I-S Kilendaris. Wow. Yeah. 
and you know that you would find her at the Bent House, which is a training facility in the Undersling District. Did you come up with the Bent House, or is that in Monty Cook? I that, need to know. That is a Monty Cook thing. I'm sorry, guys. I'm I'm creative, but I'm just not These that creative. These names are amazing. Yeah, I am. Big house. shout out. I am really good at coming up with NPCs, but Monty Cook and Shanna Germain and everybody and Bruce Cordell and all of them, they all put me to shame. It's it's like they do this for a living <laughs> or something. It's funny I'm how to that say, works. Some of them are, they're so connected to like things in actual academic disciplines and like history and literature. It's very well documented. So A++. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so uh, you would know to go to the Undersling. Great. Um, She's a gonna go. So the Undersling is a very interesting neighborhood it is basically uh, a little bit less than a mile wide but it is functionally disconnected from the rest of saturine it's on the western shore and it's basically kind of like a a standalone um uh not even as like on the western shore i actually need to pull up my uh, map because basically it's kind of connected by these underground tethers um, and I think, you know, for the sake of um, expediency, we're going to cut to your entry. Okay. So you are entering the gate or the threshold um, that moves to the Undersling. And the Undersling is so called because it basically exists within this liminal space directly under Saturine. Um, basically, you, I want you to imagine a vast chasm over which is suspended the neighborhood. The neighborhood itself has a bridge that connects it um, to the rest, uh, to the entryway uh, and to thereby to the rest of Saturine. But the interesting thing about this too is it has what is called a touch of the red. There are parts and different places within your neighborhoods uh, within Saturine that are said to be touched by different colored suns. And the Undersling is touched by the red. And the red is a very powerful, destructive force. Oh, yes. How do I how do I feel here? You feel I think that Athariel and I think that the angels inside of you flutter a little bit but you are still very safely ensconced in Saturine and within Indigo. So they're not necessarily, they've had, I think probably the first time you went here, there was a little bit of a panic uh, or kind of a fight or flight feeling, mm -hmm. but largely because as you pass over the long bridge to get into the Undersling, you look up and you see what frightened the angels the very first time you were here which are these massive chains that suspend the undersling underneath Saturn in such a way that it does not fall and disappear into this massive chasm that yawns under you. And so what is most disconcerting, too, is every now and then you will look at one or two of the chains and they are noticeably degrading hmm. um the touch of the red for some reason what you know about this district is that for some reason that kind of destructive part of its essence literally destroys the structures and the edifices that make up the neighborhood and so just as soon as you see the degrading chains and that first time you had the panic attack, that's when you see all of the thought forms on platforms on the chains making repairs, making additions. This is a neighborhood that is by definition, by its necessity, always changing, always being repaired, always being renewed, and at the same time being destroyed. It is constantly in flux. And that is that memory of first seeing this place flashes through your mind as you make it over the bridge and onto 
the main street on your way to the bent house. Now, the bent house is someplace you've been before. Uh, it is a training facility. It is largely... And the Underslinger basically is a neighborhood about warriors, about people that are there to test and prove their mettle. Uh, a lot of people who come from there uh, or want to, like, the Saturine phrase to emphasize how tough somebody one, someone is, is tough enough for the Undersling. And so you're kind of, like, remembering all of this as you make your way to the Bent House. So it's an exercise gym, this much you know. But it focuses not just on self-defense, but actual offensive fighting techniques. Mm -hmm. And the person who gave you um, probably this order, you know that they reside in the Bent House. And after a little bit of fact-finding and, you know, boots on the ground, you realize that it is Oja Kilandaris. So you are standing outside of the entrance of this training facility. And it's almost like this neon sign is out front, and you see um, these two sparring figures. Um, one is uh, appears to be a four-armed woman that is attacking a uh, in bright neon red that is attacking a bright neon blue kind of uh, oppositional figure, like kind of like a, a dude that just kind of looks like like a standard street tough. Like, think of it like, um, almost like those figures from Bioshock when they demonstrate how a, a um... The handymen work? Yeah, how the handymen work, exactly. Got you. Yeah, and, <laughs> um, and you see these, this four-armed figure give a, uh, double right cross, uh, to the blue neon figure, and you watch as the head falls off of it, and then it resets, uh, into, like, that neon standard. And uh, the doors are uh, kind of plate glass. Everything seems to be kind of like aged and kind of worn in. And as you open the door, it kind of creaks. What do you do? Ooh, well, I'm looking for somebody in particular. Um, so I'm going to I'm going to walk in. Still have the rifle on me. It's just, it's just slung across my back. Um, sort of step inside, get my bearings. Do I see Oja anywhere? Oja, sorry, Oja. Yeah. So as you make your way in, the very first thing you notice is that you are not the only person in this place that is very heavily armed. Yeah, uh, I figured it wouldn't be too big of a deal. Yeah, there are people, there is a target range in the back of the gym uh, where you can hear muted sounds of gunfire. You also see in the front of the gym uh, people doing everything from throwing throwing stars at thought form um, practice dummies mm -hmm. um, to uh, people actually exercising, um, you know, basically takedown techniques a la jujitsu um, in kind of like a, a four arena. But in the center of the bent house is a large circular arena and the ropes of the arena span the circle in a way that kind of defies kind of like the normal gravity. Normally the ropes would be straight, but they seem to lace around it in a perfect circle. And you are hearing nothing but grunts from people like exercising and like throwing punches and exercising techniques. And that is when you see the four armed woman uh, that uh, is prominently featured in the neon sign appears to be sparring with somebody and then in a signature almost like the neon sign delivers a right one-handed cross while two additional arms sprouting from below her top arms are folded in front of her. She knocks down her sparring partner. Uh, you hear bing, 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 the sound of the bell stopping at which point she extends one of the arms that's currently wrapped around her torso and uh, her right arm to pick up her sparring partner, who appears to be a youngish, um, heavyset uh, Vizlay. And you hear her say, very good. Now, get up, practice exactly what I told you, 
do the katas again and see me before the end of class. And she um, kind of takes a spot, turns uh, to the corner of the, not a corner, but like one side of the ring. I'm going to go over around the ring. I'm, she's still inside of the actual arena. Yeah, she's uh, she's in the actual ring, but, right. but what she's doing so, is kind of like putting her bag and things together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's perfect time to walk over. Um, I think Gab's pretty casual about it. Just walks over. Um, Oja Kalendaris. That is my... Pile. Say that again. The last I said part. it's been a while because she hired me, right? Oh, yeah, she, yeah, she did. Yeah, so then she's met me. Yeah. Oh, hello, Gabrielle. Yes. Oh, so efficient, so effective. How are you? It's been a while. You looking for work? In a way, I have some questions for you. Oh, maybe I can answer them. Oja, not the smartest, definitely the fastest, but I think I can answer questions. Depends on what. I want to know about Jaren the Devoured. She stops. Like, yeah, I knew that. <laughs> yeah. Um, is there a particular reason you're looking for Jaren the Devoured? Little bit of personal business. Mm. You realize I traffic in doing some business for some recruiters, less savory than others. Let's just say that he's come to my attention. Where would one find him? Make an interaction roll. I'm going to give you plus one on your venture because you already know Oja. I want you um, to, let's, we're going to shoot for a six. That's good. I'm not going to add anything to it. Okay. Because I had a crazy thought. <laughs> okay. However, that is a nine that I just rolled. All right. Yeah, she looks at you and she says, I'm happy to tell you this information. I am happy to tell you where he resides, what he's working on, what he's doing. You understand this is bred out of my mouth if something untoward were not only to happen to my employer, but to you. It's not a way I can win, but I, I can see you are very hard-pressed about this. You could say that. Take it from me. I will give you this information, because like I said, you're very efficient. You help me very much. But no, many people who go seeking the idea thief they don't come back. I'm not concerned with rumors or violence. Do I look like somebody that is? No, but maybe some concern would keep you alive. <laughs> I need answers, and I believe that he is the only one with them. She flicks her brown eyes down. Thanks for a moment. She says, yes, I answer questions. You tell me what you want to know. Where he resides? The Hollows. But I would be very careful about approaching him directly. Many tendrils, many hands, the idea he has. Maybe start with one of them. Cut off. <laughs> See who comes calling. Who's the weakest one? Hmm. Metafellow. Yes. Uh, Reedy. Red hair. Ask me for... Send some of my fighters his way. Drop the name. Didn't know how deep out of his head he was thinks that because he is touched by fire, he is flame-proof. <laughs> we know, you and I, this is not the case. But I can tell you, he will be at Cadavers tomorrow 
night down the street ostensibly after picking up some recruits so if you go maybe don't go alone fair enough he's looking for recruits what for ah jaren got some bee in his bonnet it's he has sent out a message for someone named twig he asked for it before but now it seems more serious and she pulls out a note i cannot read this i might be able to and she gives you a letter on which in bold letters is in all caps is addressed twig t-w-i-g-g if that's all it says well depends what do you do do you that's what it says unfolded uh, and on, on oh outside. sorry yeah no i would like to actually read it if i can yeah you open it and you are greeted by a series of symbols that change back and forth and seem to move and shift with the eye hmm. they seem to change shape and as you open it i'd like you to make a perception roll all right i'm gonna pump a bene into that mm -hmm. what's the venture i'm gonna say this one's uh, pretty low probably a four Yep, that's me six. Okay. So the thing that you notice when you open the note is that it's almost like when upon opening the symbols snap still mm -hmm. momentarily and then shift and begin to continue moving. So I'm not actually able really to read it. You can't. It seems to be... It, you sometimes recognize the symbols and sometimes you don't. The ligatures kind of like between the letters change. Um, some of it looks kind of similar to Visley language. Some of it looks a little bit like Yiddish. Some of it looks like English. Like it all just kind of blends and weaves and changes as you I read it. I can't read it either. <laughs> and she says no one has been able to. What's the point of asking for help or sending out recruits or sending out letters if no one is able to actually understand what it is that you want and she looks at it and she thinks i have a theory i think this is a message for somebody it's just not mm. us could i take this do mm. you still need it there are thousands of them it feels like dozens at least <laughs> i don't care less paper for me to worry about I'm going to pocket it. You never know if that's going to help get me in at some point. Mm. So, you have what you need? You need more? And she's taking her second set of arms, reaching up, and she's putting her hair into a bun. I have to have next session of sparring. You just be quick. So, Reedy is going to be at Cadavers tomorrow. That's my heading, but it doesn't give me much to go on for the rest of the day. Mm. And I think I shrug off the rifle. Um, how many more students do you have? Or can anyone get in on this bout? You are always welcome to come in, prove your mettle, prove that you good enough for the Andersling. Uh... Yeah, I think Gav, before she's gonna, she's making a mental note that she's actually gonna rendezvous back again with Maurice later that night. Mm -hmm. um, because she knows that he's at home. And since uh, she, she, oh, just like got the same sensibility as Gav about stuff. If she's telling her that she should not come in by herself, she's not going to. Excellent. Um, so, but for now, she can get some, get some fighting in. Absolutely. The next thing you see is that uh, Oja welcomes in another uh, sparring partner. She has one eye patch, um, Oja, and she's basically, she, you can tell yeah. how circumspect and also how studious she is. It's 
like akin to uh, just watching a master at work. Mm -hmm. And as you're kind of observing everything uh, and how that's going, we're going to cut to Maurice. Hell yeah. Maurice, you're making your way back down your street, back through Fartown. You're tired. You just want to rest your bones. What are you thinking? As tired as he is, um, Maurice is finally in better spirits. Um, he's actually uh, got his pipe in one hand and an ice cream cone uh, <laughs> in the other. And, you know, the, it's kind of a nice day for Fartown, at least. And it's like, well, you know, I can at least sleep in my own bed tonight. Yeah, and as you're packing your pipe, like with one, like tamping down with your thumb, uh, what color, uh, what flavor is the ice cream, by the way? Uh, it is blue. Yeah, absolutely. The flavor of blue. You are enjoying the flavor of blue. It reminds you in times of kind of like this aqua, this this clear kind of almost Caribbean style water. Uh, and then you mix it in with like the taste of like a blue Skittle. And then that's when you look up and you you are forced to look up because Duncan has audibly <laughs> and is trying to get your attention pawing on your shin. And I, I look up and I see the uh, glass on the sidewalk, the monochrome sidewalk outside of my house. And I look up and the street lamp is broken. And I look and see the wrought iron fence that was there has been bent askew. And then I look forward and see an empty patch of dirt. Your house is gone. And Maurice kind of does with two full hands, like the John Travolta, like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you do exactly that. And um, that's when you hear Duncan whine a little bit. Maurice thinks for a moment about sh like snarfing the rest of the ice cream cone and instead just kind of tosses it to the side. Um, he remembers that about two weeks, two, four weeks after he entered the actuality and was told to look for his house, uh, his house found him and it was a kind of you know dull in color compared to the rest of the actuality and it was an exact reproduction of his apartment in new york and never thought that as easily as it came so it could go and he kind of strokes his beard for a bit and is, is resolved to do what he was going to do anyway. Maybe without the luxury of a sleep in his own bed. And he clamps down on the pipe and pulls out the, the letter from Kenroy and, and does some mental math. How, how far away from the invitation date are we? I'd say it's been the better part of a day and a half uh, since you guys uh, left for the Candle Flame Keep. You are, I'd say it's two weeks until Kenroy originally, so I'd say you're about 13, 12 days. Okay. And then I'm remembering also Ashwin. Yeah, Ashwin is, as far as you know, is still kind of minding the safe house. Mm -hmm. um, but it's been some time since you've checked in uh, with them. I recall Ashwin's somewhat urgent request for help for a friend that I couldn't help in the moment. And Maurice... Maurice can do what he wants. And... He kind of sweeps his eyes across, you know, both of his neighbors' houses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, shrugs I... a little bit. Yeah, go ahead. 
Yeah, no, what were you going to say? Because uh, tell me, well, uh, yeah, what were you going to do? Well, it's, you know, if there's no one there, it's time to go. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you basically meeting this empty lot, knowing what you know about uh, what's going on with Ashwin's needs in the Topiary yeah, District. Yeah, I think I can take that same uh, trash can shortcut that I did last time to, to the safe house. So... Absolutely. Smoking the pipe with no <laughs> hurry whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Walking towards there to get to the topiary district. Excellent. And you make your way to the safe house. And you, again, kind of use the key that Ashwin gave you. Um, you find your way. You remember the trip wires and all the kind of um, the alarms, the kind of magical alarms that kind of the maker's uh, trinkets that um, Ashwin had set. And in the safe house, you find a small package with a quick note waiting for you. Small note, rather. Addressed to Maurice. Addressed to Maurice, yes. Pulls up a chair, starts taking apart the packaging. Um, and it's a note from Ashwin. Uh, Ashwin addresses you, Maurice. You were not in when I came. Wanted to check on you. She talked to me again, and she told me to make you this. And there's a small plain box. I open it. And inside of the box is what appears to be a golden pocket watch. And it is called A Dream of a Million Dreams. If the possessor stares at the watch before drifting to sleep, they can choose the nature of their dreams. It is a level one object of power. Its object depletion is zero, so you have to check with each use. And its color is blue. Maurice smiles. Does he know what Ashwood means by she? Yeah, he means the moon. Or they mm -hmm. mean the moon, rather. Mm-hmm. So, uh, yeah, Captain Maurice inspects it. No, not trying to stare too long into it, but, you know, admiring it. And um, tries to recall the, the details Ashwin shared with him the last time they spoke there was someone that was accused of murder and can you refresh my memory on that a fellow named Tristan Farn and Maurice um, actually knows someone that works in the topiary law enforcement so I'll burn a hidden knowledge absolutely you actually know um, I would say an assistant to the Garen, uh, call, uh, the Garen, uh, the Gerant rather called, uh, Joe, J-O-U. And, um, Maurice, uh, try, tries to find a, a writing implement, um, to scribble on the, the back of the note that Ashwin left him. It says, uh, thanks. See you soon. Excellent. So, Twig, what are you getting up to in the library? So, um, after Kiri's um, rather dramatic, well, after finding this book and then having it f accidentally eating it, you know, like you do, um, <laughs> and having it fall apart, have Kiri dive into the water, try to drown herself, and come out with a fucking, I don't know, mirror, mirror, coated sortier? I don't, I don't know. What is it? Is it like gold plating, or is it just like made of mirrors? How does, how does that work? It seems to be made of smoothed, perfectly, bl like, glass-blown mirrors. That's intense. Um... A twig has continued to back away, to back away slowly, and um, during this time has uh, just kind of 
sidestep. I'm actually going to go look for that small origami golem again. Okay. Um, it seemed like it brought me to that place I was before, um, that small, al- that hidden alcove. And I'm curious as to A, what it wanted, and B, I, if I, I want to ask it if it, or I want to say the knights of the name and see if it will take me anywhere. Yeah. So this, you find this golem. It appears to be kind of like <laughs> sorting through. You don't really know what its purpose is. It, um, ostensibly if there were kind of like these thought form librarians um you wouldn't necessarily need a curator or anybody to kind of like organize things if they'd been at work for a while so it's kind of unknown when you find this golem what its purpose is and you say the words knights of the name to it and it kind of cocks its head at you um, this kind of perfectly shaped um, tassel of pages, um, completely expressionless, looking back at you. And it just cocks its head and kind of waits. Then I basically do a nothing in my hands, Travolta, and I'm just like, meh? Meh? Um, it, it, you, it, it kind of like motions its hand to go, like, it's expecting for you to say more. Can you take me to a text on the Knights of the Name, please? Thinks about it. Or apparently it's thinking. You don't know what's passing through it. It's doing It's doing like the, the physical version of the fucking, um, like the circle, like the circle glass, the uh, t- fuck, hourglass flipping thing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's, Spinning beach ball. Uh, yeah. hourglass windows screw blue screen of death and it kind of ambles up to you is small form and grabs your hand and starts pulling you along with it uh, I will follow yeah it is taking you down these kind of like unique kind of like again natural passageways you see the books flying overhead um at which point it seems to be tracking movement and it points at one book as it flies over your head. Oh, that's annoying. Um, all right. So is there anything distinctive about this book? Uh, it appears to have uh, gilded, I say gilded, but more silvered lettering, lettering uh, on what appears to be a uh, green leather spine and cover. Um it's moving and flapping too fast, so you can't necessarily make out the details of the title. Is it going somewhere specific, or is it just circling, or...? it? Yeah, it seems to be just kind of, like, making... Um, it Going back and forth to its nest, it appears to be picking up, like, little random um, scraps of detritus from around the bookshelves and making off with it and bring it back to its nest. So can I I can identify where its nest is? Yeah, uh give me a perception roll. <laughs> Your pocket. It's in my pocket. My buttoned <laughs> pocket. <laughs> Quit uh, being your character. <laughs> hey, leave me alone. Um, so I would this uh, potentially be an investigation? Absolutely. Cool. So I, I have skills in that, and then I will throw an additional bene at that, I, which I believe puts me at one remaining in my perception pool. Cool. Uh, let's say this is going to be... You'll get something at five, but seven might get you more info. Well, we're in luck because that's eight plus two nice. so 10 awesome all right so you can tell you can trace its flight pattern and you also notice that it almost has kind of like this magpie kind of um uh tendency where it seems to be going after shinier scraps of paper uh other smaller books like you know like little self-help or small like for Vizlay books um <laughs> that have like a little shiny cover on them or like some sort of gloss, it'll pick up and it'll abscond with it to the nest. And you realize that if you look hard enough, you can probably find something small to try to attract it. Oh, I don't even have to look. 
I feel this book intensely and emotionally. And I just, <laughs> Twig just like starts uh, pull, pull, going into my uh, pockets and I've got bits of glass, all sorts of like a couple of shiny marbles. Like, I, I think I've got, oh, you know what I definitely have? Mm -hmm. I have an aluminum foil wrapper from a, like a, I don't know. What's the Invisible Sun equivalent of a falafel sandwich? Um, probably, uh, I was going to say probably fried nostalgia. It would oh be like fried, <laughs> fried nostalgia on pita. Yum, yum. Yum, yum. So, so my fried nostalgia on pita, um, I, I kept the wrapper. I was like, I can use that for something. And boom, here it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Hoarding. Helpful life skill. Um, I love it. And um, so I'm gonna like kind of like just crumple it just enough that it's uh, and um, yeah, I'm just gonna set a trap. All right. And by trap, I mean very lazily wait for it to come pick this up. All right. So what I want you to do is I need you to make a movement uh roll. Um, okay. as this thing kind of it. Is this a specific type of movement roll? Uh, I believe, let's see. I believe this would be a kind of like a speed attack. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, what is it? Agility? What is? I'm trying to remember what that what, certes what goal is. is. What, uh, what I, I believe it, it could be movement and it could be accuracy. Yeah, let's actually say accuracy. All right. Cool, cool, cool. You cool, are cool, trying cool. to snare the trap in such a way that up. you catch the, um, catch the uh, book. And yes. so the book. This is such a fucking weird game. I love it so much. Yeah. The book kind of flutters and jumps to the shelf under which you're hiding, I assume. Um, yeah. Actually, yeah. Actually, you know what? Yeah. No, no, no. I'm, that, let's not bog this down. Uh, I would like you to, as it kind of hops down. To, I am very stealthy. To pick up the wrapper. Mm -hmm. I'd like you to make a accuracy roll and uh we're gonna set it for five for five um i'm gonna pump some sword religion into this awesome so roll two dice all right i'm gonna say that my magical dice will be the uh cell phone because i only had time to find one okay <laughs> um, <laughs> so that's a nine on the non-magical dice. All right. And a six on the magical dice. Fantastic. You get it, son. You snatch, nice. you snatch the book up in your hands. It flutters and struggles. And then, like, I think you kind of reflexively point its cover towards you and it settles. Uh, you stroke, book hunting. I struck I struck its spine a little bit. Uh, and it just kind of like flutters a little bit. And then the front cover opens on which the title page is written notable organizations of the indigo sun already then and there are several organizations listed here there's the church of midnight there is the knights of the name there are the five uh the four orders uh there is an additional miscellany on uh apostates uh, there is also another organization called Pathwalkers that is listed. And, you know, there are minor organizations that are also listed, um, but those are the ones that you notice right off the bat have the most page count uh, uh, devoted to them. What do so you do? So nothing on the... I would like to look... Oh, actually, there would be also the Knights of the Name. Pardon me. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> hmm. I'm like, God damn it, worthless golem. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, if it oh. was properly indexed, the golem would have been able to find it faster. Mm -hmm. Exactly. That's why. <laughs> that's why. We, that's why we need your expertise. This is true. You're not wrong. Um. So yeah, I will. What I will flip tonight's the name. I've we've run across or uh, twig has run across encounters to or uh, encounters run across like mentions and experiences with all these other orders mm -hmm. the knights of the name is the only thing that we got basil to slip his tongue about yeah absolutely um and you slip his tongue uh, mm. you good phrase <laughs> so uh, if, mm. you see the description very clearly this notable organization um 
currently headquartered throughout the actuality in numerous cells is a group of self-described altruists. People, some call zealots. People who believe that it is the utmost height of morality to hold themselves to a higher standard as dictated by their own name. Their, their name of any given knight of the name is the name to which they hold themselves accountable and to one which they pledge themselves. Many knights are not actual warriors or combatants, but span the gamut of the professions, from shopkeepers to bureaucrats to <laughs> medical professionals as well as soldiers. Herein, we find their mantra. And in this kind of narrow paragraph setting, you read, My greatest weapon is my integrity. Earned respect and adherence to principle are my armor and my shield. If I cannot look every person in the eye, I am nothing. If I cannot abide my own soul, how will any fight alongside me? And you recognize that last passage from the passage that was written on your mind tree in your forest. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And in addition, uh, furthermore, it says, you know, the ostensibly the goal of the Knights of the Name is to crusade against injustice, to struggle against tyranny, and to right the wrongs in a way that seems foreign to every other organization within Saturine or the, uh, the actuality as a whole. And from there, it begins listing notable figures in the history of the Knights of the Name. And not only that, uh, inset on one of the pages, is what appears to be a moth, a gigantic moth coated in a, uh, or um, basically wearing a gigantic coat of armor. And a, I think uh, a little inscription below the inset illustration, uh, which is kind of in a woodcut style says, um, one self-described knight of the name um, in traditional attire. So the Mothman's a knight of the name? It appears to be so. You you don't see a description of a Mothman. I'm pretty sure a whole bunch of people's fan fictions just got really <laughs> ratified. What Amazing. have I done? <laughs> the Lord's work. <laughs> um... But it also goes on to describe that while there are many chapters of the Knights of the Name um, throughout Saturine in particular, uh, largely um, chapters within uh, the Knights of the Name are largely self-directed and they don't tend to follow a centralized figure. Intriguing. Um, I, I So I will read all of the stuff on the Knights of the Name so I can just remember that. Um, and I'm going to let the book go and let it keep the sandwich wrapping. Yeah, it it basically clasps its um, its book shut over the wrapper, kind of pushes it, muscles it up with the creases into the like kind of like the spine in the center uh, and then flutters off, having it kind of like thus secured. That's amazing. Oh, I love compensated it for its information. Mm -hmm. I would also like to um, find little page golem and um, just um, thank it and ask if it has a name. It doesn't seem to understand the question. It just keeps or... cocking its head at you. Give it one. Do it. Yeah. Um, so do I get the sense that this is not a sentient thing? That it seems to be performing a ro aut autonomous... Uh, auto 
Fuck. Um, autonomic tasks. I still think that's not the word I'm trying to say. Yeah, you don't necessarily give it like sapience. You think it's sentient, um, but it doesn't but seem to be. It's not sapient. It's it doesn't seem to be exhibiting kind of like self-directed intelligence. Yeah, but would it like to be? It's up to you. I could also eat it. I'm not gonna. I mean, I could. You're not wrong. Um, but I would. So I am going to. So I will reach down and hold up my hand to it, um, and wait to see if it will take it. It steps forward, and the pages kind of like ruffle onto your palm. And I will begin. I cast the spell that I have just learned. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say what you what uh, a book that was observing would see is um, my blood begins to pour out of my right sleeve, but it's not. But it's intertwined with black ink. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of working its way down in tendrils and to the two fingers that I'm holding out for this thing to grasp. And that flows into the golem. Uh, remind me, does this spell give uh, the creature the uh, gift of speech? I... So I spend some of my life to give uh, the spell grants. It's some combination of mobility, senses, ability to eat or feed itself and anything else that might require. But otherwise, I don't think it gives it the ability to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, not it, speech is not necessary, is not explicitly implied. That's perfect. What ends up happening is the it seems to shudder a little bit and kind of uh, kind of tilt one way or the other and then it kind of writes itself and you see all of the pages in that make up its chest they start flipping and that same ink that you kind of let flow out of you into it they form a word um i and then it forms i think and it reforms, you can call me. And it thinks a moment. And then the ink spreads out into this very well calligraphic, um, hand lettered um, text that says Literalum. Literalum. <laughs> Literalum the Golem, yes. I'm sorry. I I know it's is cheesy, he, but I thought it was great. It's the, the best. <laughs> is he a member of the literati? I guess oh. now he is. <laughs> I'm 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 so I will um shake his little page hand and say a pleasure to meet you, literalum. And it kind of ambles up. Literalum shakes your hand vigorously, and we're gonna cut to Kiri. What have you been up to in all of this time? Um. Kiri's been at a desk, actually. So she's had lots of documents in front of her. Um, and in fact, I think probably somewhere in this process, Twig, you hear her um, call out from the other side of the library to you, something like, Twig, when you have a second, come here a moment. I want to show you something. And you might be imagining it, but it almost sounds like she's abashed. What do you... Um... Do you keep your distance or do you um, go and meet her? Twig? Uh, Hopper, you have an audio issues? Yeah, sorry. Oh. Um, let's say for now that um, Twig doesn't respond immediately. What do you get up to? Okay. So. Kiri, having called that out, you know, assumes that Twig's probably off busy doing something, reading something. Um, and so she's, you know, basically looking through a bunch of documents, like I said, that she has spread out on the table before her. There are contracts, uh, receipts, scholarly journal articles, um, many of which are actually written in code, um, in handwriting that keeps changing. 
Um, sometimes it's cramped and angular. Sometimes it's looping and floral. Um, there's also a table of abbreviations that Curie has uh, found hidden on the flyleaf of one of the books. Um, and a little bit of librarian magic for you. Um, as Kiri passes her hand over the table of contents, it kind of sparkles, and uh, she's able to physically lift the uh, transliteration of each abbreviation from the table of contents, and the ink kind of transfers to her fingers, and she, with the care and precision of a surgeon, places it onto the abbreviation on a different document um, as though replacing or, you know, creating the lines as they were written in the original archivist's um, notation. Okay. And what are you looking for? I'm looking for some mirror information. I think having found a mirrored sortier and having seen a reflection that was more than just simply my reflection as I am in this world and combined with the information that um, she learned from the mysterious being um, in the bedroom. She wants to know, she thinks something about the weapon is connected to mirrors. And so she's trying to, well, beginning to establish a curatorial system for King Nine and starting to do the beginning of that work is also trying to round up information on mirrors. Um, and has come across as many of these sorts of documents, both scholarly study and um, banal transaction, sale of mirrors, use of mirrors historically, um, what mirrors have meant, that kind of thing. Um, and is just trying to piece together everything she can about that. Uh, so I'm actually going to draw a card for this because um, Twig cast a spell and also you are using magic to um, kind of lift this information. Uh, mm -hmm. So let's find out just exactly what you find plus cards being drawn yeah are you are you back hops yeah quick question can you hear me yeah we're yeah good. you're and good is is the video jacked up no you're great video is good yeah. everything just crashed here um, no no so i had to rest i just restarted the chat and it was all right but you're, you're fan uh, don't worry okay. you're good um so in this case uh hopper in case you didn't hear it um we had to draw a card because uh Kyrie i got that bit i did i dropped in at something research mirrors cool hmm. uh okay so i'm actually going to change the music for this let's see honestly that's how you know things are serious is when the dm goes so i'm going to change the music yeah. right. <gasps> why this card is the th oh. hold on this don't like that <laughs> no rappers guys this card is the Vizier, which is the nemesis of notions, cats, clocks, and wind. No. <laughs> so while the nemesis is in play, all actions are decremented by one. If you are, mm. if, you, if it belongs to your school or to your um, heart, your actions are decremented by two. So its meanings, manipulation, sycophant, power and influence lurking in the shadows the vizier controls from a distance they do not sit upon a throne but instead are the power behind that throne they don't make laws they circumvent them but they do it to further the ends of the ruler the land or perhaps themselves the vizier has a secret agenda within agendas their smooth words manipulate everyone even the ruler they supposedly serve thus they have much of the real power and influence are they acting in the best interests of the ruler or themselves? How can we ever be certain? The vizier is the nemesis of notions. They cannot be trusted. So. You are looking into everything pertaining to mirrors. You do not find information about... Actually, I'm going to make you roll for this. Okay. Okay. I'd like you to make a research roll. So I'm going to say intellect, yeah, but add, my favorite. yeah, I was going to say, add your, um, add your vent to your venture, your skill. All right. I actually have two relevant skills here. I've got magical lore and searching. Uh, um, let's add, let's add two then for magical lore and for searching. Perfect. Um, yeah. And so I'm going to say you're going to get something on an eight. Okay. Let's do it. 
and that's an eight on the dice. So awesome. that's 10 Woo! overall. Nice. All right. So 10 overall, you are looking at this and you don't find knowledge pertaining to mirror weapons. This is a concept that seems kind of unknown in this. It seems very particular and very specific. What you do get is a bunch of cross references about significant weapons, but also they don't, they seem to be mutually exclusive about your information regarding mirrors. So okay. the one thing you do understand about mirrors, at least what your research dictates, mm. there is a small text. It is a journal written by an observer of uh, kind of magical anthropo magical diseases. Ooh. And okay. you find some things about things like house rot, um, house cancer, spidering, uh, literally when the um, an object kind of grows eight legs and runs off and can grow offensive. Um, <laughs> You have... I'm sorry, fucking what? Terrifying. Oh my gosh. I don't yeah. like that. Yeah. And I don't even have a fear of spiders, but the idea that you just undergo some spidering is... Mm -hmm. uh, excuse me. <laughs> yeah. There are all kinds of manners of awful diseases that you find cataloged in this book. But the thing that is troubling to you is the last entry in the journal, which goes into the study of mirrors and the mirror virus he says i've tried making contact with the entities that i divined live inside of the mirror i have tried every manner of stimuli and this is from day one of the journal mm -hmm. but to no avail i receive no response day two some success, albeit somewhat troubling. I can swear I think I see someone looking back at the mirror, at me from the mirror that is not me. Its movements are subtly different. Its coloration, its visuals, but it moves in tandem well enough to match me in such a way that I think it might be mocking me. More to come. Day three. I have grown so sick of this entity. It seems to taunt me, even going so far as to wear the face of one of my previous lovers to whom I was unable to stay romantically linked. I resent the mirror and what it shows me. And Curious there's trying to get chills at this point. There's a small note underneath it says, I think I found a second mirror. Where did it come from? Day four. I found a third mirror today. I grew impatient with it. I hate this thing, whatever it is. And so I smashed all three of the mirrors. I hope that this puts an end to my study, however disappointed it may be. Maybe I should find another mirror and conduct the study anew. Day five, in panicked scribble, you read, Oh God, oh gods, save me. Bizla, protect me. It's coming. And it's, it's cut, and it seems to cut off. Is there anything distinctive about this last entry besides that the handwriting looks particularly panicked or there, rushed? There is a sheen of magic to it, as if he was, if as if the author was trying to fire off a message spell. Is there a way I can try to receive that message or investigate further? You you know for a fact that the message was kind of what it was he was trying to write. At this point, I think Twig um has having heard Kyrie's calling, will 
appear back in the what are we calling this the atrium Just, yeah i guess like the and, uh, rotunda mm-hmm. i've got uh i've got literalum hanging out chilling on my shoulder um and i'm coming so twig's coming back and i'm like hey look at this guy um and when <laughs> like but the first thing i see is kiri looking like like you just saw a thousand ghosts yeah she's absolutely pale just almost like horrified looking but it's almost like raised a flush to her cheek like she's she's looking you know around the pages of the journal do we know uh who the journal was written by zach uh it's written by a a fellow named uh odo bigard Uh, odo 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 B A G A R D E Odo Bagard. Okay, and that's not a name I probably would have encountered before. Uh, not without further research. Okay. You do know for a fact that the amount of scholarship that is at work here and the amount of rigorous kind of study and experimentation suggests either a maker or a Vance. Okay. Um, could possibly be a Goetic as well because it's talking about. Um, actually trying to make contact with the thing right but you which know which would be a very vancian impetus yeah but at the same time like a goetic would typically summon something they want to talk mm. to so you're not that's sure that that's the case but per the earlier entries just so i'm remembering this and getting it in my notes correctly the entities didn't reply or actually physically speak to as far as the journal is able to tell me yeah this odo guy yeah just it's- more mirrors like, just like, yeah, he, Odo seemed to be testing in more mirrors, trying to, but feeling like it was responding, but just never in language. Yeah, and you get the idea that the mirrors were were not necessarily that he was grabbing more mirrors, that they were reproducing. Oh, okay. Like, just, repli- like in Kiri's original dream at the beginning. Yeah, there's another mirror. Doesn't mean I went and got another mirror. That means another mirror showed up, and that is, f- fuck that. Fun. Um, so I will say this with the additional, um, with the 10 that you got, your additional look at, uh, weaponry, um, weaponry as it pertains to Vizlay can span a number of things. They can be traditional implements, things like guns, knives, um, you know, tonfa, whatever kind of martial weapon you can kind of find in the, um, gray, you can probably find in the actuality as well. You can see kindled items that are magical and powerful. You have magical consecrated items and, um, weapons that are, um, you know, meaningful in, um, their enchantment and in the magic they expel, like sortiers. Um, but the other thing you notice is that oftentimes magic, uh, spells can be used interchangeably as weapons. Uh, as well as talking about people who have mastered the form, uh, which is a series of martial techniques. They are called mm. the forms. So it's essentially Vizlay martial arts. Okay. Mm-hmm. But it would it would seem, perhaps after this sort of research, that the fact that I've just pulled a mirrored sortier, which is a weapon in its own right, out of a pool, and connecting that to what the things in the mirror said to me, I might make a connection between those two things. Yeah, absolutely. Or start to suspect that there is one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so given that is the case, um, do you research any... Oh, one other thing you would notice is as it pertains to weapons, you find a note on mm-hmm. a uh, detailing a particular secret, um, mm. which is called... Um, Weapon Whisper. Hmm. Um, So as you read this, you kind of understand how um, someone, if they whisper soft commands and assurances to their weapons, um, as uh, in the midst of battle, they can actually augment their abilities um, to um, succeed with said weapons or augment the weapons themselves. Hmm. Scratch your scratch your rifle yep. behind its bolts. <laughs> Make it happy. No. Gonna have to learn that. Yeah. Amazing. Uh, one other thing: Are you looking up anything else, or are you super focused on this? 
Um, that was my primary focus, but I think I would also want to gather materials about the war report, just any document that mentions it, even if the document, all that says is like, you know, it's fabled or it was thought lost this year or something. Um, um, yeah, a lot of it, like you don't find any specific reference to a war report. Um, you do find oblique references to the war. Uh, and again, it's frustrating the amount of detail that these documents lack. Um, yeah. Basically, it feels like somebody went through and just removed all of the words pertaining to detail about the war. Um, right. It's, um, it's frustrating, but it is not something you are unfamiliar with as uh, somebody who is a student at the Dance Academy. And it's as you kind of dig deeper into this at which point um you hear both of you i mean twig where are you while you uh kakiri's doing this i'm not sure chronologically where we're at right now basically i was working my way back i think it took a decent amount of time um to get to because i we were taking weird side passages i assume like you know naturally occur naturally occurring uh spaces between the stacks and the shelves mm -hmm. um so i heard kiri a while back it just took me a while to get back here and literal i'm i was just like is hitching a ride with me um i'm kind of excited i'm ex twigs excited to, to be like hey look who i helped me um and I think that you're kind of like showing off, and that is when you see Basil uh, standing over Kiri with a pile of books and gently, with a very gentle thud, um, they appear on the desk next to your um, additional research. Um, at which point Basil looks at you and says, I found some relevant texts, at least those that pertain to my situation, but... I understand you seem to be making a discovery. Yes, Kyria looks up at uh, Basil and says, uh, "Thank you. Yeah, I, I'm just trying to, you know, uh, find out as much information as I can about some odd occurrences. You know, some strange things with mirrors and uh, anything, of course, to do with the war and the war report, which I know you've seen, but." I just want to know as much as I can so that we're going in prepared. I'm afraid it's a very singular artifact, and I'm happy to help you in the future. But in the meantime, I have to focus on the task at hand, and I think I've found a way for, um, for my wish to be fulfilled. And he opens a large book. Um... And there are several sheafs of paper kind of nestled in the book, one after the other, and they appear to be long-form magical spells. Um, you know this from your time in the Vancian Library. Uh, things like monographs are, uh, you know, not necessarily common, um, but they represent a significant source of magical achievement, and they typically describe long-form magic. Um, but what... It seems that Basil has done is not only procure several texts re uh, related to rituals as well as to invocations, but also several powerful spells. And he says, I think that this is, this is our path forward. And I'd appreciate it if you help me. Curie sort of takes the books from him and, you know, she's very familiar with monographs. Every young Vance, in order to graduate and become first level, has to publish or uh, lodge, lodge actually one monograph in the library and she's responsible for um, curating all of those and keeping them. And so she looks up at Basil gratefully and says, thank you for helping with this. We're going to, I, I'm going to do my best to help you. And uh, I can't speak for all of my friends, and she looks a little wistful, wistful, but I can speak for myself. I appreciate that. And um, for what it's worth, I do not seek to be an antagonist to you, any of you. I just, I'm just so desperate. I know. I could see it in you when you came to us the way you did, and I empathize with 
using puzzles and manipulation, when you see what strings you have to pull and you just, you don't see another way, I can see why that would be the path you'd take. Thank you. I, I appreciate that. Um, I'll, yeah. What do you do, Twig? I, so Twig, we haven't really established a, a solid crunchy timeline here. So I've been heading on my way back. Um, I would say actually, if I heard Basil talking, mm -hmm. um, before like, but you probably heard him before I saw him around the last corner, I would be very quiet and very stealthy and try to observe and listen and analyze this person without their knowledge of my presence. So make a stealth roll. Uh, your challenge is going to be 10. And mm. then I'd like you to make a perception roll. Dope. So I have a I have a skill in stealth, mm -hmm. uh, one, and um, so argument's sake, I um, I'm gonna put a bene into that into the stealth for sure. Argument's sake, I have I have a skill the skill sense motive, mm -hmm. um, as a grubby street rat. So I will say this: um, your sense motive will work for your follow up perception roll. Mm -hmm. um or your like if you want to use intellect or that's, interaction. that's what i'm I, that's what i'm talking about for the second roll right i want it for stealth obviously stealth for the first roll and sense motive for the second so for um stealth uh you can very handily use uh hidden knowledge if you'd like i will absolutely do that how, um how do you how do you use stealth in the way that you have learned about <laughs> so the way i use hidden knowledge is that um is that as as I approach, I'm coming from a different direction than I was before. I'm uh, like I'm starting to get more comfortable with the library, and uh, it, it's the natural, organic nature of it feels just right. Um, the way it's kind of grown beyond its own intended bounds, and uh, literalum, actually, just tugs on my tugs on the uh, the cuff of my jacket or cuff the lapel of my jacket as I'm about to step into an area that was once maybe carpeted, but has since the carpet has since become this own growth of its own. Um, and it's in it, it. If I were to step on it, it would be much crunchier than one might anticipate and literal I'm tugs on my lapel. And so instead I sidestep and, uh, having learned a little bit of non like non text not n knowledge but given this insight from this little creature that i have befriended all right in that case uh roll a uh roll with three to your venture you're gonna try to hit a seven or above mm -hmm. shit that's a six okay oh. that is a mixed success though so what I'm going to say is that you do have a moment to at least observe Basil succinctly before you give away your position. Um, so why don't you, or secretly while giving away, uh, before giving away your position. So make your sense motive roll. Um, add your venture. You can add a bene if you'd like. Um, uh, what is that a interaction bene or an intellect bene? Uh, I'd say, let's say it's an interaction bene. Okay. Don't have much of those. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Um. All right, so that's two from my sense motive, and then one from my bene. Okay. And that is another six. Okay. Six. So nine total. Yes. Okay. What are you trying to find out? I want to see whether I'm trying to identify what his goal here is. Whether he's being genuine. Whether he what he's bringing is a manipulation in and of itself whether this is poison disguised as a gift, uh, metaphorically speaking. Like, I, I want to see what... I'm trying to see how many layers his, his current actions have. So I'll say the two things that you grok from that, and um, you just kind of very handily... You see a deep sadness in his eyes as he's looking at Kiri, um, and sincerity you don't necessarily get any kind of ulterior motives. You do understand that Basil is always calculating and always thinking, 
but you seem to have caught him in an unguarded moment. And that is when the shuffle of pages uh, from Literalum's grasp around your hand um, shifts his attention up. And he so around my love, he's on my shoulder now. Yeah. And he... I think... Mm-hmm. Oh, I was just going to say, I mean, I think Kiri was perhaps about to say something to Basil, but as that flutter of pages happens, just to catch the timeline up, um, Kiri's eyes sort of flick over to Twig, and she sees him there, but continues on, sorry, them there, and continues on with what she was going to say anyway, as though it was fine that they are there for this. Um, To Basil, she says, Bibliomancy, book magic... You, if anyone, Basil, would understand this. It's my discipline, my life. That I understand. And that is why I trust you to do this and why I'm grateful for your help. It's my work. It's everything I know. And as you may know, too, it can be tedious and time-consuming and thankless. But it's what I'm good at. It's what I'm for. And I have to solve these problems the way that I know how. And Kiri's voice here is very businesslike, confident, authority has settled back into it, as though she's kind of come up from being shaken by reading about the mirrors. And nevertheless, I am grateful, and um, I understand. And, you know, he again clocks that, like, observation. I understand that you are going through a... some manner of a difficult time. I'm happy to assist you in whatever way I can before my compatriots and I depart and I grant you the war report. Any assistance you can offer would be appreciated, Basil, and moreover, I think you can understand where where I'm coming from and I'm glad of that. And he nods and looks to the stack of books he's laid in front of you and says, uh, well, in that case, shall we? And he begins cracking open the sheaf of books, and the camera pans out on the two of you. Um, Kiri, that look of kind of business-like demeanor, but at the same time, your eyes flicking back the camera close up on you as you think of the idea of someone being a weapon. The camera cuts, and we see Twig, Literalum, perched on his shoulder, on their shoulder. And basically, you tight close up on your face as you try to ascertain the unascertainable, the idea of a fictional creation and its intentions and its motives. We cut to Maurice. Maurice, you have made your way and your shelter back in the couch of the safe house. Probably fallen asleep, your tobacco and your pipe spent. Do you choose to dream of anything in particular? Yes. Um, what, what time of day? Did I just take a cat nap? What's going on? You tell me. I think, I, I think we are, I don't think it's quite yet uh, evening. And I think Maurice is going to um, cast some spells as he heads out to meet uh, Joe. Uh, he's going to cast the spell he cast before using his forte. Uh, the exact same spell, in fact, uh, the learn from tales to learn from Basil, to straighten his spine and speak with more confidence. Um, which and he'll put three bene additional bene into his uh, interaction pool what's more on top of that he will take the elements of interaction and the elements of speech and weave the strands together to be better than basil and Casting at level four will add five Bene to his interaction pool. I love it. Uh, and walks out the door, or actually, before he opens the door, looks to Duncan, who stands up, 
shakes it out and walks out the door with excellent and finally gabrielle what are you doing to prepare for your mission I think if we're flashing forward in time a bit, which it sounds like we are, then the first thing that you'd see is Gav leaving um, the, what is it, the bent house, Um, like wiping blood off of like a bloody lip from having fought um, and sparred with uh, a couple of the people there. and is taking off to try to find Maurice in preparation for tomorrow. For the um, so yeah, go oh ahead. sorry. No, go I ahead. think that she would make her way back to the house and then see the same site that Maurice saw, which was like no house is there. Um, I don't feel it's too much of a stretch for Gav to think that the next place she should go is the safe house. Yeah, absolutely not. I think your instincts would kick in at this point. Yeah, Um, and I I think she'd be making her way there. I think you probably make your way and you see Maurice just leaving his spine straightened more upright. There's this more kind of keen confidence and keen sense of purpose uh, in his stride and in his demeanor. (laughs) Somehow his beard is less scraggly. (laughs) Um, yeah, she'd probably, um, go up to him and, uh, would just be like, hey. So glad you found me. House is gone. What? I know. I saw the house is gone. But (sighs) guess what? We might have an inn with Duran. I mean, I was actually on my way to talk to somebody else but that's great that's great that you have an in and i'm i might need your help well i mean duncan it's okay (laughs) i really owe ashwin a favor and it's tomorrow not tonight sorry it's tomorrow not tonight okay i mean this might take a while and like i said i need to do what i need to do i have every faith that you can handle it. What about this? Can you handle this? Duncan, please. <laughs> what, what am I handling? Gav, Gav pets Duncan. Um, and uh, no, you just, you mentioned Ashwin. Yeah, I, I don't know if you, no, I didn't tell you about this. Um, one of his friends is in trouble. In jail. Oh, I see. It's on my way to solve the case, as it were. All right, Uh, solving the case. I don't know how long this contact will stay. They're going to a specific place tomorrow. Jaren is hiring recruits. Whatever is going on, he's stepping up his forces. I think he's now aware that he can't track us anymore. I mean... I'll always worry about you, but... Hang on a second. I pull out the letter. Have you seen something like this before? Maurice, yeah, Maurice tries to read it. Uh, Again, you notice that... um, uh, uh, Gav, you notice that the... Again, it seems to shift, and you realize it's like the text is trying to ascertain whether or not Maurice is the intended recipient. And then it begins again moving... Mm. And not only that, um, yeah, I think that I will say this, Maurice, you see this and you actually, you have a faint, you know, wonder whether or not you could somehow using weaving or approaching another weaver, whether or not you'd be able to decipher something like this. This is curious. I might be able to read this, but it would take some time. This Keep is it. from Jaren, right? As far as I know. I mean, it's um, probably another uh, death missive, right? I'm sure it is, but you never know what could be in there. Sure. Uh, do, do you want to keep it? 
I'm not going to be able to figure out how to read those types of things. I just, I mean, I want to be completely honest with you. I don't know when I'm going to get to it. Uh, I think Gav is like trying to hide her disappointment just a little bit and then takes the letter back. Um, I think she really thought that when you like left with her, you were coming with her and, and the knowledge that that's not actually the case is like just starting to kind of really click in for her. Um, but it's like there for a, a half second and then it's like, all right, big tough soldier attitude is back. Fine. Um, good luck with your business. Maurice is packing a pipe and says, go kick some ass. Yeah. And, Obviously. And the camera pans out. And you, I think as Maurice, you stride off in this separate direction. Gav, I think you do feel a little alone, disappointed, like you said, as you kind of come to this understanding, all of you separately, that you have to do what must be done. And... All of these challenges face each of you individually, your knowledge separate, no longer pooled, no longer lent towards a common goal. I think all of you struggle with that fact, even however briefly. And that's where we're going to end tonight's session. Damn. So, um... Let's go ahead and do quick recaps, uh, no more than five minutes. First off, I want to say um, thank you to Without Limits uh, for hosting us. Um, that is really cool. And also to all of our chatters. You guys are awesome. Uh, thank you for watching the show with us. It's really our pleasure to keep on um, performing and uh, streaming for you all. And we're really looking forward to the next episode. Uh, that being said... Uh, next episode, uh, we are actually going to be dark, um, just because we are going on a little bit of a retreat, a few of us. Um, not only that, but we will have, um, fewer, um, cast members for the episode following that. Um, so we might actually be doing, um, some minor, um, development mode stuff that will probably be an abbreviated, abbreviated episode. Um, but nevertheless, we're going to make sure that, uh, we try to, uh, get you guys some good stuff to enjoy in the meantime. Mm -hmm. um, that being said, let's go ahead and quickly do our recaps. Um, Gabrielle, how did you feel about tonight's session? Wow. Um, I think there's something to be said. She's excited now to be on a trail and actively doing something that's that she can actually contribute to and do something with. Um, and I think there's a little bit of disappointment that an ally that she thought was coming with her is actually not. Yeah. And like, she also has to wrestle with the idea that that act, act that actually hurt because she wasn't expecting it to. Cause like right up until kind of this moment, she has not really thought of herself as part of this group. Yeah. And I would like you to take one despair as you kind of realize the, um, uh, uh, exactly the kind of like the use of being that part of the of a group of uh of friends like that and not only that i'd like you to take one acumen for um your fact finding mission um to uh the bent house great um okay twig how'd you feel about tonight's session oh oh um so basically twig is this was high highs and low lows um the watching the only people that they have any emotional connection with kind of struggle with that connection was deeply painful i think that um learning learning more about this knights of the name thing following that lead that little tangible breadcrumb of knowledge was definitely felt good and uh the act of cr not creation but um giving assisting and giving life to something um was powerful absolutely uh, as some yeah like as somebody who's a nourisher a, a grower 
um, at their core. To, I think that was really important to Twig. Do you feel like joy was the overriding emotion there then? <laughs> uh, I think that I, I would say we started off hard and um, I would say joy, but joy in the sense that a lot of that was kind of a direct reaction or like a, a coping skill to get away from the despair that they felt with that initial bit. So overall, the probably final tone would be joy. Excellent. Okay, take one joy and one acumen for learning your secrets and also creating literalum. Literalum. Uh, I love it. <laughs> yeah, it's great. Uh, somebody in chat, uh, I believe mentioned, uh, having fan art of literalum. So please throw it at us. That would be great. Um, <laughs> Kiri, how'd you feel about tonight's session? Yeah. Kiri's in a very tough place right now. Not a place that I feel like she knows how to navigate very well. She's used to kind of having everything under control. And I mean, from the outburst in the pool to, you know, feeling the confirmation of, Gav and Maurice leaving her when she finally felt in her element like she could do something, like she could help with her particular skill and expertise. She wouldn't necessarily admit it, but I think that really did affect her in a certain way. And so I think it almost hardened her a bit. And, you know, it was another repair in the armor, I guess, in that solid plate armor of her stoic nature. Um, I think, you know, at the moment she's at once at home, completely in her element, able to research the things she needs, fall back into those patterns of her expertise. But at the same time, I think perhaps for the first time, she's truly afraid of the horror of the mirrors and the knowledge that she gleaned from the journal of what might be coming for her um, if the pattern played out again. And, you know, I think she also feels pretty alone in that fear because she's just been, you know, kind of rehardened and she doesn't, you know, feel like she can trust anyone with that knowledge. So she's going to tell herself she can weather it. Absolutely. Take one despair and also uh, take one acumen for finding out more about the mirror virus. Um, finally, Maurice, how'd you feel? So I think Maurice um, is feeling uh, untethered in a positive way, in a, in a f kind of freedom kind of way. Um, he went I, out for cigarettes and left the kids. That's 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 exactly that's it, actually brutal. That's, wow. That's, that's, that's it's really it's really it. It's the it's the it's the um, freedom of abandoning responsibility. Uh, at this point, however, Maurice is feeling good. Um, he has started his own, like a, a new, um, what's the, what do we call it? Invisible Sun when you have the quest. Oh, uh, a new arc. Uh, arc. arc yeah. yeah. So his new arc, he is, he's helping Ashwin now. Excellent. He, and, he, and he's doing what he wants to do. So, and it, yeah. Yeah. So he's feeling good. So it sounds like you've actually concluded uh, the help arc um, for helping um, Twig and helping Oof, them. Did I? Oh, oh. Fuck. yeah. No. So, I, I thought I could just kind of leave it. Damn. No. Okay. So here's the thing: reward yourself um, two acumen for completing the arc. Reward yourself one acumen for um, uh, also kind of taking it upon yourself to take action and um, find your next course of action. Um, but in order to trigger the new arc, I think you have to pay either one or two acumen. We'll confirm that later. Mm -hmm. Um, and take joy, take one joy. Um, so, uh, guys, first off, thanks so much. Uh, if you're joining us, uh, once again, we're super happy to have you. Um, uh, let's go ahead and say any plugs that any of the other, uh, players would like. I have a couple, but let's start with you guys. Is there anybody, uh, who wants to go first? Yeah, um, I, I think you know what I'm going to plug, but right here on Man and Pot Studios on Thursday, um, tune in for uh, a Dungeons and Dragons 5e mini adventure. Um, I Is it the fifth one? Uh, it's, it's the, the fourth, fourth one. one. It's, it's the, the fourth, fourth one. one. I can yeah. do math. I can't do math. <laughs> um, for Gardens of Golshan, six-part miniseries, um, and things are really heating up, so you really should 
tune in this week. It's pretty fantastic. It's a murder mystery set in a homebrew campaign world. Um, you should definitely check it out. Uh, Liza as a DM is amazing. Um, I'm biased, but you know, at the same time, uh, it's also objectively true. And uh, the just it's such a beautiful show. The cast is really amazing. Um, if you don't stay and watch Chastity and Belief and Zozo and uh, our our swashbuckler friend I'm blanking on, who's played by Justin Collar, who's amazing, and I'm sorry, Justin, um, you are doing yourself a disservice. Um, my one plug on top of that is Encounter Party is in the middle of season two, episode four just dropped. Uh, if you really like um, podcasts set in um, Ravnica uh, and are interested in more D&D live plays, uh, you should give them a listen because they are amazing. Um, they're actual, honest to God, um, guild actors, and they're perfect, and they're wonderful in every way. Uh, oh, the performers are fantastic, and everything's lovely, and it's done. They've put so much effort into it. Go listen, enjoy. It's <laughs> a fucking and, masterpiece and johnny z80 uh we are very happy to make your day so uh come join us next time we're really looking forward to seeing everybody again and uh also we made somebody's day that makes me happy yeah. <laughs> and, joy for everyone and not only that guys we have all uh all 12 you know 11 episodes um oh up on youtube now uh we're going to have this one up probably by next week uh and not only that but we are working on a recap episode for the episode audio that we mm -hmm. lost for Alas. uh episode 11 or ten. yeah ten. 10 pardon me episode 10. honestly that's after. like mysterious and cool the lost episode i know yeah, yeah. yeah we've got <laughs> The we've lost got now. treasure. That's the one. That's the one we save until like five years from now, and then we do it. Yeah, in yeah. LARP. Mm -hmm. yeah. Guys, one last thing before we all sign off. Just another, not really a plug, but for any of you who are going to be at PAX East, I think there's a couple of us that'll be going. So come say hey. We love meeting people IRL. So hit us up there. Contact us on Twitter or through Manipod or however, and we'd love to meet you. Yep. Thanks again, guys, and uh, once again. As always, may the invisible sun shine on you all. Good night. Good night. Go Niners. Bye, everyone.